Okay, so here's where we are. Now notice here, um, I, I make comments about the, the homework problems I believe I have in the, in the videos I have posted on YouTube already. So uh, I have a, a, a video, for example, from a Monday office hour, which a student allowed me to record. Uh, and also I worked out these problems, this one after class, for example, this one after class Tuesday, these others I did, uh, when did I do those? I guess I guess I did uh, this. Through, these are in the office hour on, from Monday. I have that posted also for this week. Okay, uh, and then these two after class on Tuesday. Uh, the, these two after class. One last Thursday. One this Tuesday. Okay. Now, um, now this weekend is going to be a, a, an intense grading period for me. Now, where we are, we're going to uh, now today we're going to finish chapter six. Six three six four are required. Six five is cool as part of the curriculum, but but it's not part of the homework, and I wouldn't have tested on that. All right, uh, and remember that chapters five and six, chapters five and six, okay, we're gonna go, uh, have our homework sessions next week. I'll start chapter seven in the meantime, but, uh, but the homework sessions will be next week, and then this homework will be due Friday, November 13th. Uh, and by the way, um, uh, in the middle here, Wednesday is Veterans Day. So don't forget that uh, uh, Wednesday of next week is Veterans Day, November 11th. Okay, but uh, that doesn't affect our class directly. All right, so that's the game plan. We have Thanksgiving coming up in three weeks. Uh, that's, the, that's the game plan. Any questions thus far? Any questions thus far? Again, uh, questions in chat are welcome. All right, so feel free to put questions in chat. Let's get started then. Okay, so today is lesson 20, day 22, sorry, day 24, part one. All right, let's uh, blow this up. We're recording, all right. Hi everyone, this is section 6.3 on vectors in the plane in R2. In your Math 252 class, you'll talk about vectors in three space, R3. So first of all, uh, uh, before we talk about vectors, we need to talk about scalars. A scalar has magnitude, but not direction. So can a scalar be negative? Uh, it depends on the context. Uh, for example, later on, when we think of real numbers as scalars, then scalars can be negative. That's okay. An example of a scalar is a speed, such as 55 miles per hour. That's a scalar quantity. It has magnitude, but not direction. And again, sometimes scalars can be negative, although here speed cannot be. But then we have vectors. Vectors have both magnitude and direction magnitude and direction. There's a clip from Despicable Me I can send out. There's actually a character called Vector. <laughs> now, a vector can be written in various ways. So, for example, it might be written with a half arrow on top. Uh, like when I'm writing uh, symbols for vectors, if I'm writing on a whiteboard, I might write it with a half arrow on top. Some books would put like a ray notation, a half line on top. Uh, in my notes, I denote vectors using boldface. That's fine for my notes for type print, but of course it's hard to write boldface when you're writing with a pencil or a pen. So uh, if, if you're writing with a pencil or a pen, I might recommend this sort of half arrowhead version over here. That's what I would tend to write on a whiteboard. But you need to indicate the distinction between a vector and a scalar. You absolutely have to know a difference because uh, on homework, and on exams, I often have questions, and these are hard questions, right? For university students, these are hard questions. Here's an expression with scalars and vectors in it. Does this expression represent a scalar, a vector, or is it undefined? And those are really hard questions for university students. <laughs> They're some of the hardest. So know it's a scalar, know it's a vector. And uh, write these down accordingly. Now again, a vector has magnitude and direction. The magnitude 
is denoted by this here, which is this boldface V or the half arrowhead on the V with a pair of vertical bars. Actually, uh, two pairs. <laughs> Actually, it's two pairs of vertical bars around the V. This is sometimes called a norm or length or magnitude. So again, uh, this is often referred to as uh, not just magnitude, but norm or length. It's, an, it's a numerical measure of the vector. It's typically associated with its length. The length of a vector indicates its magnitude. For example, the directed line segment, this arrow guy below, is a velocity vector. This here is a velocity vector, which again, we can denote with V with a half arrowhead on top. This is a velocity vector, which has magnitude. That's the length of the vector, which is in fact the speed. The magnitude of velocity is the speed. And the direction here is, of course, the direction in which the object, such as the car, is going in. So here, the car, let's say, is going in a somewhat northeasterly direction. A, a vector has magnitude, like speed, and direction. The magnitude, the speed here, is the length of the vector. This vector is equal to this vector. So these are two representations of the same vector. These are equal vectors because they have the same magnitude and direction, even though they don't hold the same position on the page. So remember, vectors are characterized by magnitude and direction, not by position. We have the right to move these things around. These are two perfectly good representations of the vector V. They have the same length and the same direction, but not necessarily the same position. These are equal. Now, the direction of the arrowhead does matter, okay? Uh, so here, this vector is going from this initial point to this terminal point. We can think of this as a displacement vector. It's like we're walking from this point to this point. It turns out that the opposite of V will take us from this point over to this point. This would be the initial point here, and this would be the terminal point here. These are not equal vectors. In fact, these are opposite vectors. These are opposite vectors. So it's not like a line segment where I can ask you, what's the slope of this line segment? It doesn't matter which order we take the points in if we're doing slopes. But here, it matters what direction the vector is going in. These two vectors are opposites. They have the same magnitude, but they have opposite directions. So what about the geometry of vectors? How do various operations on vectors affect their geometry? Let's talk about scalar multiples of V, which is given by, and this is what I mean when I say that it's important to know the difference between a scalar and a vector. What's a scalar multiple of a vector? A scalar multiple of a vector could be something like 2V, 3V, negative uh, 1V, or the opposite of V. But remember, we need to indicate clearly what a vector is. So if I can boldface these, right, oops. <laughs> so I'll, okay. So if I boldface the V, whoops, I can just boldface one. <laughs> right. So the idea is that I try to boldface the V. I don't know if I can do just him. All right, but I'm supposed to boldface the V. <laughs> I guess I have to do this. So here's two, here's V, and I'm gonna boldface the V. There you go. <laughs> so here we have the sca a scalar multiple of a vector, like two times V, three times V, and so forth. All right, so CV, where C is some real scalar, like two, for example. In this case here, uh, C could be negative, like negative two or negative one. Okay, so the new vector, CV, okay, uh, this is a scalar C times a vector V. The V here is bold-faced. Although, if you're writing this, then you might want to write the V with a half arrowhead on top. You have to indicate a vector somehow. Now, the length of this new vector will be the absolute value of C times as long as V. So, for example, 2V 
will be twice as long as V. But also, negative 2V will also be twice as long as V. So both these vectors, 2V and negative 2V, these will be twice as long as the original vector V, as vector V. All right, I guess I'll put the half arrow on here. All right, and if C is negative, then CV points in the opposite direction from the, from the direction V points in. So if this is the vector V, all right, uh, again, 2V, same direction, but twice as long, but the opposite of V would go like this. Same length, but opposite direction. Negative one half V would point in the direction of this guy, but will be half as long. The absolute value of the scalar multiplier uh, gives you the multiplier on the length. That's why I say the absolute value of C. That's the multiplier on the length. Bear in mind, there's also zero V. Zero V is the zero vector, which is denoted by or indicated by a point with no arrowhead. But, but the zero vector is a vector. All right. How do we add and subtract vectors? Vector addition can correspond to combined or net effects. So for example, if V and W are force vectors, then the resultant vector, the sum here is called a resultant vector, V plus W, this would represent net force, as we'll see. Vector subtraction may be defined as you might suspect. So to subtract a vector, you're adding its opposite. That makes sense, that's what we do with real numbers, you add the opposite. So what are a couple of ways that we can graphically represent vector addition? What is the triangle law? And this is especially helpful for ideas of displacement. So let's say that uh, you're here at a palm tree and uh, if, if and when we're allowed to go outside, right? So we're at this palm tree here, right? Uh, we dig underground and we find a treasure map. The treasure map says, okay, to get to these concert tickets over here, when we can get concerts. So think of your favorite band, okay? And your favorite band's concert tickets are at this spot here. The treasure map tells you that you have to start at this palm tree, follow the displacement vector V over to this point, and then follow the displacement vector W to get to this point, and then you dig and get your favorite band's tickets. So here, what's the resultant vector? Well, you may as well, as, an, as the net result of all this, you may as well have started here at the palm tree and gone straight to the point with the tickets. So this would be the resultant vector V plus W. It's easy to see as a sum of displacement vectors. Uh, uh, you ultimately started at this point and you ultimately ended at this point. So uh, uh, the head of this arrow is attached to the tail of this arrow. It's like you're following these steps. Again, better for sequential effects and displacements, like walking. But what about that force example I gave before? So imagine that there's a, a pool table with a, a pool ball, like the white cue ball, for example. Right. I, I remember watching an episode of A Thousand Ways to Die. Uh, there is this foolish person who liked to sort of kind of swallow, uh, uh, kind of half swallow pool balls, and he died when he swallowed, guess what, the biggest ball, the white cue ball. So don't swallow cue balls. <laughs> all right, anyway, that's your lesson for today. Okay, so uh, speaking of pool, all right, imagine a pool ball here, right? And imagine a pool table that is frictionless. That's not realistic. Uh, you almost have to think of an air hockey table almost, but imagine a frictionless pool table. We have a pool ball here. Imagine that one cue stick, like one wooden stick, hits the ball in this direction, and the force applied corresponds to the length of this force vector. And another cue stick, a second cue stick, hits the ball in this direction, but with a greater, with a greater force corresponding to the length of this force vector. So the idea is that when you combine the effects of these two forces, uh, you may as well have hit the ball with this net force, this resultant force vector, 
This is the resultant force applied to the ball in terms of direction and the net force, the magnitude of the net force. Uh, it's called the parallelogram law because you can draw this resultant vector uh, uh, by, by uh, 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 setting up these two vectors. So their initial point is at the same point, right? The point where you hit the ball. Uh, and then you form the parallelogram formed by this point and these two vectors as adjacent vectors, as adjacent sides on the parallelogram. Then you fill out the parallelogram, draw this diagonal from this point here to this kitty corner point over here. That's the parallelogram law. Uh, the triangle law, you can see why it's called the triangle law, right? You're completing the triangle. So that's how you add vectors. And again, to subtract vectors, you'd, you would uh, add the opposite. So for V minus W, okay, you would take the V vector over here and you would add the opposite of W. Okay, and that resultant vector would look more like this when applying the parallelogram law. All right, V plus W V here. Again, better for simultaneous effects and net force, as opposed to sequential effects and displacements. Next up, we're actually gonna play with coordinates. We're going to put these vectors in the rectangular or Cartesian plane. Next time. A, a few things, and I'll go ahead and uh, stop the recording here. All right. Okay, questions in chat, all right. Hi everyone, I have a question for you. Let's say that you're standing at a palm tree over here. You dig and you find a treasure map, a treasure map that will guide you towards your favorite band's concert tickets over here. Now, I have a question for you. If you wanted to know two bits of information about how to get from the palm tree where you are to the tickets over here, what two bits of information might be helpful? In fact, can you think of two different schemes? Uh, can you imagine two different lists of two bits of information that can help you get from this point to this point? Well, uh, one way is to follow the rectangular or Cartesian plane. Uh, maybe the treasure map would say, go three meters east, and then let's say four meters north. And then you could dig and find your tickets. But what other pair of bits of information could be helpful aside from just horizontal displacement and vertical displacement? You might ask, for example, I'll put this in blue, how far are the tickets? What is the straight line segment distance? between the two tickets, and then what other piece of information would be very helpful? Because if I just tell you how far the tickets are, then potentially your search path would be a whole circle, right? If I just tell you, oh, the, the tickets are five meters away, well, there's a whole circle that uh, the tickets could be on. What else would help? A direction, perhaps in the form of a direction angle, theta. I'll call this R. R and theta, these are polar coordinates. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about describing a vector. Let's say this blue vector over here. We're going to describe this vector in terms of Cartesian coordinates, like we did in red. That's more like thinking uh, east and north. Cartesian coordinates versus, in blue, I'm considering polar coordinates. Whoops. Blue over here. I'm considering polar coordinates. Artesian coordinates versus polar coordinates. Cartesian coordinates thinks more in terms of horizontal and vertical displacements. Polar coordinates are thinking in terms of distances and direction. Sound familiar? Magnitude and direction. Okay, so let's consider first the Cartesian 
picture, vectors in the rectangular or Cartesian plane based on a Cartesian coordinatization of the plane. We're talking about different ways of coordinatizing the plane. Coordinatizing the plane. All right, so let's let the vector V be given by this component form, where A is the horizontal component and B is the vertical component. Now, these symbols here are not parentheses, they're called angle brackets, and they're used to help denote components of a vector. So over here, the position vector for V, really it's a representation. Uh, the position vector representation for the vector V is drawn from the origin, that's the initial point, okay, to the point AB over here. That's using the classic parentheses. So we use classic parentheses to indicate a point in the plane. These angle brackets are used to indicate this vector because remember, this vector can be placed here where it starts at the origin, or it could be placed over here, or over here. These are all equal vectors. They don't have to start at the origin. If we start the vector at the origin as the initial point, then we have a position vector or position vector representation. It's the most convenient represent representation usually for the vector V. Okay, so this is in terms of Cartesian coordinates or components. Now, what about the polar picture? In blue here, what about the polar picture? All right, so the polar picture, theta here is a direction angle for V, and we usually take it to be an angle between zero degrees and 360 degrees. Uh, we treat direction angles as standard angles here, where the initial side is the positive x-axis. Remember that the magnitude of V, uh, or the length of V, is denoted like this. And actually in polar coordinates, we tend to use the letter R. So in this chapter, I'll actually use these two symbols interchangeably. In fact, R is what you get used to later on in calculus, like in Calc 2, Math 151 at Mesa. Although, as we'll see in Chapter 10, later on, we're going to consider cases where R could be negative, uh, whereas lengths, uh, uh, like the length of V here, cannot be negative in Chapter 6. Later on in Chapter 10, we'll see that R could be negative, actually. That's if you go in the opposite direction. All right, so uh, remember that if I take two distinct points in the, in the coordinate plane, right? Maybe the axes are here, for example. All right, so if I take a directed line segment from this first point, x sub one, y sub one, to the second point, x sub two, y sub two, okay, then this is a representation for a vector, v. How do we get the components? Well, for the horizontal component, it's the change in x, and the order matters, okay? Unlike for slope, where there are two different ways of doing it, the order matters. It has to be the new x-coordinate minus the old x-coordinate. Remember, to get these components, it's got to be new minus old, right? The new x, the x-coordinate of the terminal point, minus the old x, the x-coordinate of the initial point. Likewise, delta y, that's a change in y. It's got to be the new y minus the old y, y sub 2 minus y sub 1. It has to be like this, okay? And of course, for slope, we could do this over that, right? But with slope, we could, actu we could actually switch these and switch these. Here, we're not allowed to do that. You cannot switch these, and you cannot switch these. It's got to be in the order new minus old, new minus old. I'll do an example of this later on. Okay, next up, we're going to convert between Cartesian, the, I guess the Cartesian perspective, and the polar perspective, okay? In a way, how do we go from Cartesian coordinates to this point? If we have a position vector representation here, how do we go from Cartesian coordinates for this point to polar coordinates? That's basically the idea. How do we go from A and B to theta and R? Or vice versa. Next time. Think about that. How do we do that? Uh, in the meantime, any questions? Any questions? So think about how we go from red to blue and from blue to red. What ideas would you use? Think about that. Let's go on. Hi, everyone. We have here a vector V. Notice this vector notation here, this half arrowhead. The vector V 
can be represented in this Cartesian component form, where A is the horizontal component, B is the vertical component, and we surround these by angle brackets. That helps indicate that we have a vector. And of course, the comma here. We can represent this vector using this position vector representation, where we draw the vector from the initial point at the origin, 0, comma, 0. That's where position vectors start. The terminal point is at the point A, comma, B. This is the classic way to represent a vector, although we have the right to move this vector around. Now, if we are given little a and little b, if we're basically given the coordinates of this terminal point, where the initial point is at the origin, then what formulas can we use, can we derive, to get r, or the length of v, the magnitude of v, and theta, the direction angle? How do we go from basically Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates for this point, this terminal point? So if we are given a and b in red, how do we get r and theta in blue? First of all, how do we get r, or the magnitude of v, the length of v? Well, we're given two side lengths of a right triangle, and these can be signed. Remember, a and b can be negative also. Uh, we could be in a different quadrant. We could even be quadrantal. But let's say, well here, A and B are positive. They represent sides of a right triangle, the legs. How can we get this hypotenuse from whose theorem? You know him, Mr. Pythagoras. So from the Pythagorean theorem, which is also related to the distance formula, R, Blue. R, which we represent as the, uh, which we're using as a substitute also for the magnitude or length of V. Remember, you tend to use R more in calculus. R, or the length of V, is given by this, because R squared equals A squared plus B squared, right? From the classic Pythagorean theorem, R squared equals A squared plus B squared. Or if you wish, you could use more generically x squared plus y squared. But here, a and b are particular values of x and y. Don't worry too much about that distinction. All right. And, and to find r itself, you take the non-negative root. Again, in chapter 10, we'll let r be negative. But for right now, in this chapter, r is non-negative. We zap the plus minus. So that's going to be a formula that will get you a value for r, or the length or magnitude of v this length here, the hypotenuse. Now, how do we get the direction angle, theta? We're interested in theta. You have B and A. You have the opposite side length and the adjacent side length. I guess side length. They could be negative or zero. Uh, opposite over adjacent. What trig function relates an angle, the opposite side, basically, and the adjacent side? How about tangent? How can we relate theta, A and B, or X and Y? Okay, well, we need tangent of theta to be B over A, or if you prefer, Y over X, more generically. Bear in mind, A cannot be zero, otherwise this is undefined. But if I tell you that the tangent value is undefined, that's helpful. That means that we have maybe a 90 degree angle or a 270 degree angle. Now, I have another note here. Make sure that theta is in the correct quadrant. Because you might be really tempted to say, well, if tangent of theta is b over a, can't I just say that theta is the inverse tangent of b over a? Well, that's true if b over a is positive. and theta is quadrant one. But in other cases, you better be careful. Just in general, you should be careful uh, and make sure that theta is in the correct quadrant, especially when this thing's negative. <laughs> but actually, if this thing is negative, then wait. Uh, remember, the range for inverse tangent is basically from, in degree measure, from negative 90 degrees to positive 90 degrees, but wait a minute, 
we usually want our direction angle to be between zero degrees and 360 degrees. So if you take the inverse tangent, uh, if you have a quadrant four angle, then we actually don't want the inverse tangent because we don't want negative angles. So be very careful about using this inverse tangent notation. It's true that if the tangent value is positive, right, uh, they were either going to get an acute angle or zero degrees. That's fine. But be very careful about using this inverse tangent notation. There can be some pitfalls. And also, you might end up in the wrong quadrant, as we'll see later on. So what we can say is this. We need that tangent of theta is b over a, assuming that it's defined in real. But also, make sure that theta is in the correct quadrant. <laughs> okay, so pick the angle appropriately. And you have to consider quadrant issues. Or maybe the angle is quadra uh, quadrantal. All right. So let's do some examples. Let's do an example. Example. I guess I'll, well, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll go up here. Example. Let the vector v, remember, uh, if you're writing it, you might want to write it like that. I'm bold facing it here. Let the vector v be represented by angle brackets, negative 3, comma 5. So we can think of it as going from in position vector representation from the origin zero, zero, whoa. Hey, what quadrant is this guy in? That's, that's a first consideration. What quadrant is this guy in? <laughs> well, if you draw it as a position vector, right, uh, negative three comma five, that's where the terminal point is. What quadrant is that in? What quadrant is that in? Negative three comma five, hey, it's in quadrant two. That's a big deal, all right? So keep that in mind. Okay, we're gonna deal with the quadrant two angle. Okay, so if the vector is this, in component form, find the magnitude or length of v, remember we're thinking of that as r, and also the direction angle theta, where theta is between zero, or zero degrees, and 360 degrees. Okay. okay. Well, some angle in here has to work, right? Pick the right one. Let's round off theta to the nearest tenth of a degree. So read instructions. Okay, folks, how do we go from a and b, I guess I'll put this in red. Uh, how do we go from A and B, or if you wish, X and Y, to R, or the length or magnitude of V? We use whose theorem? This Pythagoras. All right. So the length of V, or R, is going to be the square root of, remember R squared doesn't have the root, R does have the root here, the square root of, a squared plus b squared, or x squared plus y squared. Remember to put parentheses, the square of negative 3 is positive 9, all right? The square of 5 is 25. We have the square root of 34, which is simplified. On an exam, I might say that uh, distances are measured in meters, okay? Like along the x and y axes, distances are measured in meters. So it might be good to put a unit like meters. Now, let's say these are scaled in meters. So root 34 meters, that's going to be the length of this vector, the magnitude of this vector. As far as how far you have to walk from the palm tree over here at the origin to get your tickets over here. Okay, how do you get theta, the direction angle? Well, we're going to need this formula over here, right? What relates opposite, adjacent, and the angle? Tangent, all right? Tangent of theta is b over a, or if you wish, y over x. Tangent theta is b over a, or y over x. It's going to be the five over the negative three, okay? Remember that, a lot of people switch these. It's like slope, right? A lot of people switch the slope and they turn it upside down. It's the y guy over the x guy, the y guy over the x guy, five over negative three, which is negative five thirds. So the tangent value is negative five thirds, okay? Now, folks, if you were to do the inverse tangent, let's think about this. If you were to do the inverse tangent, what's the range for inverse tangent? It involves what quadrants? Quadrant four and quadrant one, right? The, this represents the range for inverse tangent. Okay, so... Now, wait a minute, though. Wait a minute. What vector, uh, as a position vector, what quadrant is our vector in? 
Remember? It's in quadrant two. It's in quadrant two. Uh-oh. So if you do inverse tangent of negative five-thirds, you're going to end up in quadrant four, and we're going to have to do something about that. So, again, tangent theta is negative five-thirds. Uh, remember to put your calculator in degree mode because in, in chapter six, we tend to deal with degree measure. Okay. The inverse tangent of negative five-thirds is negative 59.0 degrees. We can use that, but that's not our answer because negative 59 degrees, okay, is not inside the interval here. So this is not our answer. I'll put this in red. It's not the answer. In fact, it's not even in the right quadrant. It's not even coterminal. It's, it's not even in the right quadrant. <laughs> Where is negative 59 degrees, folks? Where is that? It's in quadrant four. All right, here's a picture. Okay, okay, so here's the deal. Negative 59 degrees is in quadrant four, right? I'll put that in red. He's the wrong guy, right? <laughs> so negative 59 degrees, he's over here, right? We're going in the exact opposite direction we want to go in. We want to go in the direction of quadrant two. We want to go in this direction. So what's, a, what's an easy way of getting from this direction over to this direction? In terms of angles, how many degrees do we add to the negative 59 degrees to get to this correct direction over here? We add how much? We add 180 degrees. It's like a politician doing a flip-flop. We're going from here, quadrant four, to here, quadrant two. Here's the picture. The calculator gave you, for inverse tangent of negative five-thirds, it gave you negative 59.0 degrees. You're going in the wrong direction. I mean, you want to go in this direction to get your concert tickets. You're going in the, in the exact opposite direction. You're making things worse. <laughs> You're gonna have to backtrack. Okay, so how do we backtrack, right? We have to add 180 degrees. Okay, and then we get in the right direction, we get 121.0 degrees to the nearest tenth of a degree. So this packet of information should be enough. Okay, I could have said to get to your tickets, go uh, three meters west and five meters north. I could have given you Cartesian directions, or I could have given you polar directions. I could have said, okay, so you want to go in this direction. If you have a compass, you want to go in this direction, represented by this direction angle. It's, you're going to go northwest in quadrant two from the palm tree at the origin. And you're going to walk route 34 meters. That's between five and six meters, almost six meters. So you might want to bring your iPhone with you, keep track uh, of uh, how far you've walked. All right, so there we've gone from Cartesian to polar, basically going from Cartesian directions to polar directions. Next, we're going to go from polar to Cartesian. Right, A any questions before we go on? Any questions before we go on? All right. And how would we go from polar back to Cartesian? Let's go back to the picture here. Well, let's, let's, go, let's go straight to the video. <laughs> to polar directions. Next, we're going to go from polar to Cartesian. Hi everyone. So we just went from Cartesian to polar. Let's now go from polar to Cartesian. So let's say that uh, you're here at the palm tree at the origin and this treasure map tells you what direction to go in. That's theta, the direction angle between zero degrees and 360 degrees and also how far to go. We can denote this by the magnitude or length of V or R. So let's say you're given R and theta, these polar coordinates for this point over here, the terminal point where you can get your tickets. But let's say that uh, you're looking at a map and you want to know, well, how far east do I go? How far north do I go? 
what are the Cartesian coordinates of this point? How can I write this vector in Cartesian component form? I, I guess I should write this in red, maybe, or purple. Okay. How do I write the how do I write the vector in Cartesian component form? Uh, when you think Cartesian, you might want to think cartography, the science of map making, going east and north. Uh, now, cartography was not named after Descartes, but it's convenient that these sound alike. <laughs> How do we go from polar in blue to Cartesian in red? In a way, this is faster. If you know Sokatoa, remember Sokatoa, the ancient curse from chapter four. Okay, let's say that uh, we're given this angle. We, let's say we want to know A or X. And then later we'll, we'll look at B or Y. But let's say that we want to know A or X. Well, we're given an angle and the hypotenuse, and we want to know about the adjacent side. What relates angle, adjacent side, and hypotenuse? That sounds like cotomy. Cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. And likewise, what do you think is going on here? <laughs> okay, to get the opposite side, B or Y, what relates an angle, the opposite side, and the hypotenuse? That's going to be sine. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So it looks to me like we're going to need cosine in order to get A or X, and we're going to need sine in order to get B or Y. Sokatoa. So again, cosine of theta is A or X over the length of V. Again, you might think this more easily as cosine of theta is X over R. For practical purposes, that might be easier. Cosine of theta is X over R. Therefore, X is R cosine of theta. The X component here, the horizontal component, A or X more generically, is given by R cosine of theta. x equals r cosine of theta. Likewise, uh, I'll put this in purple. Uh, what about sine of theta? Sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, so it's going to be b over the length. You could say y over the hypotenuse, r. Sine of theta is y over r, opposite over hypotenuse. So y equals r sine of theta. And in fact, in calculus two, you tend to think of it this way. Uh, converting from uh, polar to Cartesian. You, th you tend to think of it this way. X equals R cosine of theta, and Y equals R sine of theta. That's an easier way to think of it. X equals R cosine of theta, Y equals R sine of theta, which means that when we resolve this vector into Cartesian component form, A comma B or X comma Y, we can do it as a one-liner. It's basically r cosine of theta comma r sine of theta, where r is the length of v, the magnitude of the vector. So in a way, this is easier. And the quadrants work out in everything. <laughs> All right, it wasn't like that tangent deal up before. Again, this is literally a resolution. These formulas allow us to resolve a vector into its Cartesian, horizontal and vertical components. We're resolving a vector. All right, here's an example. Out in the flat desert, so it's not on a hill, out on the flat desert, let's say North Korea shoots a projectile at a speed of 50 miles per hour. That's pretty slow for a missile, but let's say that the, the initial speed of this missile is 50 miles per hour, that's a scalar, and the angle of elevation this direction angle is 30 degrees relative to the flat desert. Okay, uh, so from this polar information, uh, uh, 30 degrees, that's the direction angle, that's theta, uh, r, r, or the magnitude of v, the length of the vector, is 50 miles per hour, that's the scalar. Remember, this speed here is the magnitude of this velocity vector. And this is just the initial velocity vector. We're not being too ambitious. We're not trying, we're not trying to trace 
the trajectory of this vector in the long run, okay? We're just looking at what's happening with this missile at the very moment that it's fired, <laughs> okay? Just at time t equals zero. We're not looking in the future. This is the initial velocity vector, v. So we're going to resolve this vector into its Cartesian component form, into the form angle brackets a comma b, or x comma y, Cartesian component form. Well, I showed you the handy dandy formula, right? Uh, again, r, or the length of v, the speed is 50 miles per hour, uh, theta, the direction angle, is 30 degrees. This is the polar information, remember. So this here is the polar information, and we're going to convert to Cartesian. We want the Cartesian components. Okay. So, so uh, the vector v is a comma b, or if you wish, x comma y. Oops. Oops. So again, up here, this is polar. And then over here, this is going to be uh, Cartesian. Here we go. Cartesian. Okay. We're going to resolve this vector into Cartesian components. A comma B or X comma Y. X is R cosine of theta, Y is R sine of theta. So X is 50 cosine of 30 degrees, Y is 50 sine of 30 degrees. These are known special angles. You shouldn't even have to use your calculator. 50 times cosine of 30 degrees is root 3 over 2. And then 50 times sine of 30 degrees is 1 half. You better know that, right? A physics professor asks you, what's sine of 30 degrees? You say, sir. Or ma'am, it's one half. Okay. Simplify, we get 25 root 3 for the horizontal component, 25 for the vertical component. Technically, we should put the unit miles per hour for both. A lot of books don't do that, but technically, these two components share the same unit, miles per hour, as the hypotenuse here, R. All right. So uh, what does that mean? That means that the horizontal component of velocity is 25 root 3 miles per hour, and the vertical component of velocity, initial velocity, at time zero, is 25 miles per hour. Uh, now, what does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, if we assume that the vector keeps on going in this direction and with this speed. Uh, now, I, I realize that uh, uh, Earth's gravitational pull will not allow that. Maybe this is happening in outer space. Imagining, imagine this is happening in outer space. Law of inertia, okay? This missile is just going, flying out in outer space. So same direction angle, same speed. Okay. Uh, well, then, if you imagine, if you imagine uh, lights coming down, like on Earth, right? Imagine the sun, it's at noon, the sun's rays are coming down, okay? And we're looking at the shadow, the shadow of the missile along the desert floor, all right? Uh, basically, the horizontal component of velocity tells us how fast is this shadow moving along the desert at time t equals zero, right? So it's, that, it's at that instant, okay? Uh, at that instant, at time t equals zero, at the time the missile is shot, how fast is the shadow moving along the desert? Right. Uh, actually, even when you consider issues of gravity, uh, that, tends not, that tends not to change too much over time. It's really the vertical aspect that changes when you consider the gravity aspect. Okay, again, you can think of this in outer space. <laughs> okay, now what about the vertical component of velocity? Still, it's easy to, to set up analogies on Earth. Uh, imagine that there's a big wall here, okay? All right. Uh, and imagine a bunch of floodlights over here. You have a bunch of lights coming here where the light rays are going perpendicular to this wall, okay? So you have the shadow of this missile up against this wall here, right? And the shadow is moving, okay? So at time t equals zero, okay, how fast is this shadow moving up this, this screen, this wall here? That's kind of ide the idea. Horizontal and vertical components of velocity. Uh, how fast are the shadows, the projections moving on this horizontal line over here, 
on this vertical line over here. Uh, you talk a lot about projections later on, especially in linear algebra, math 254. Okay. We're resolving this overall velocity vector into horizontal and vertical components. So if you're talking about driving a car, this velocity vector is in the direction that you're driving your car in. And then you can talk about shadows relative to these guardrails, maybe. Next up, okay, computations, working with the numbers. How do we work with these component forms for vectors, these Cartesian component forms, and how can we apply uh, operations like scalar multiplication, addition, and subtraction using these Cartesian component forms? We're gonna work with numbers. We've been talking about geometry and trigonometry. We're gonna go more with the numbers now. All right, any questions? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Hi, uh, Application, addition, and subtraction using these Cartesian component forms. We're gonna work with numbers. We've been talking about geometry and trigonometry. We're gonna go more with the numbers now. Okay, any questions? Any questions? All right, questions in chat? Hi everyone, we're now going to manipulate vectors and compute with them numerically. Before, when we added vectors, we used ideas like the uh, triangle law, like for displacement, it would look like this, or the parallelogram law, like two Q sticks hitting a pool ball. Draw a parallelogram, here's the sum. I'll put the sum in red, actually, or, or blue. So these were geometric ways of adding vectors, but there are also computational ways of doing it, and it's very straightforward. To add two vectors in component form, you just add corresponding components, add the horizontal components, add the vertical components, same for subtraction. Uh, and what about scalar multiplication of a vector, multiplying a vector and a scalar? We distribute. We multiply each component of the vector by the scalar, which makes sense, right? Because let's say this represents a vector v. Okay. What's the deal with 2v? How is 2v different? 2v is twice as long. And you'd expect that you would double both the horizontal and the vertical components. Examples uh, work out very cleanly. Let's say the vector V in Cartesian component form is angle brackets, three comma five. Let's say vector W is angle brackets, negative one comma negative two. Find four V minus two W. Now, instead of trying to get a ruler and trying to uh, lengthen this by a factor of four and so forth, Let's do it computationally. 4v minus 2w. I'm going to write out what v is and write out what w is. I'm just substituting these in. We distribute in the 4 and distribute in the 2. Uh, I actually recommend, uh, actually, I recommend distributing the negative 2 because in the end, it would help to frame this in terms of vector addition. So I would actually recommend distributing in the negative 2 into both these components and, and turn this into a, an addition problem because we're much better at adding than subtracting. We saw this in long division and we'll see this in matrices later. Anyway, when you multiply a vector by a scalar, you multiply each component by the scalar. So for example, the vector V tells you to walk three meters east and five meters north. Four V tells you to walk 12 meters east and 20 meters north. So you multiply each by a factor of four. So 4v is 12 comma 20 in angle brackets. Okay. When you distribute in the negative two, we get plus negative two times negative one is positive two. Negative two times negative two is positive four. Addition is easier. So if you have a minus sign here, bring in uh, negative two in this case. Addition is easy. 12 plus two is 14. 20 plus four is 24, you add the corresponding components. 14 comma 24, that's that. It's a lot easier than trying to draw arrows. <laughs> okay, now we've talked about multiplying a vector by a scalar, that's when you multiply the scalar in to both components. We can also define scalar division. We can talk about dividing a vector by a scalar. 
provided that the scalar is not zero, of course. To divide a vector by a scalar, uh, well, when you divide by any non-zero number, you're multiplying by its reciprocal. And again, you could distribute this in, we get a over c comma b over c. Basically, to divide a vector by a scalar, you divide each component by the scalar. And by the way, this works in Cartesian, not polar. We're talking about Cartesian components. And this is going to help us because we're going to do this in the next section. All right, uh, any questions? Any questions? And this next thing is something you're gonna routinely do in Calc 3. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna play this and a little bit of the next video, then we'll take a break. Hi everyone, our favorite vectors have what length? What's our favorite number besides zero? How about one, one unit? Not even any units like feet or meters, how about one unit? <laughs> unit vectors have length or magnitude one, r equals one. We often denote unit vectors by u. Remember, if you're writing it, you want that half arrow thing. So whenever I write u, think unit vector, although not all books follow that convention. Because books might write v, w, and then they might go back to u. So be careful. When I write u, I mean unit vector, but not all books do that. Now here's something that you do all the time in Calc 3, Math 252 at Mesa. You do this all the time. You're given a vector v. The, okay, you're given a vector v, all right? And you have to find the unit vector in the direction of v. This is called normalizing a vector. You're making it standard in a way. Where you're kind of doing a standardization process. So to do that, so, so first of all, what's our aim? You're given this vector, a vector v, and it may have a length like four or five meters, let's say, uh, and you want to find the unit vector that points in the same direction. This is the vector u. Uh, and it has length what? Length one, one unit. You can imagine a compass okay, where the radius is one. Your little compass here. <laughs> and you see these unit vectors all the time in formulas, proofs, and derivations with vectors in calculus three. So how do we get from V to U? So uh, to get from the vector V to the vector U, you take the vector V and you divide it by its length or magnitude. Now, if you're uncomfortable with the idea of dividing a vector by a number, uh, imagine that you're multiplying by the reciprocal of that number, the reciprocal of the length. Again, normalization, we do this all the time in calculus. So for example, find the unit vector in the direction of the vector V. If V can be represented by an arrow, a directed line segment from the initial point, one comma two, to the terminal point, four comma six. Here's the example I was promising earlier. Uh, one comma two is the initial point. Four comma six is the terminal point. So when we draw, okay, so here's one, two, here's four, six. When we draw this, when we consider this arrow, this representation, okay, let's find the vector V in component form. What do we do? We basically subtract the X coordinates, new minus old, and we subtract the Y coordinates, new minus old. And remember that formula way up here. Where was it? It was way, let's see, where? was it uh where was it <laughs> here we go here we go okay <laughs> so you're given two points okay find uh, the component form of the vector corresponding to the arrow that takes you from the initial point to the terminal point there we go and again it's new minus old four minus one is three six minus two is four all right so the vector v is three comma four is a quadrant one vector. 
Okay, so we have this vector V. We have this vector V, all right. Draw it as a position vector. Okay. I want to find the unit vector that points in the same direction. Okay, first let's find the length of the vector V. The length or magnitude of V, R, right? Um, the length of three, four is the square root of three squared plus four squared. We're lucky. Here it's a nice integer. Bear in mind it could be a, a, a radical, an irrational number. We divide the vector by its length, three comma four, all divided by five. You do, you do divide each component by this denominator, so we do get three fifths comma four fifths. Remember, that's how we divide a vector by a scalar. Okay, we divide each component by the scalar. Okay, so this will be, these will be the components for the unit vector. And these don't have to have units. We're guaranteed this has length one. As a check, you could see that the square root of this squared plus this squared is gonna be one. This guy squared plus this guy squared is gonna be one. All right. And we love unit vectors when it comes to proofs. I'll talk more in just a moment. Uh, first off, I want you to meet our favorite unit vectors, okay? Well, the vectors that take you one step east, one unit east, that's called the vector i, and the vector that takes you one unit north, zero comma one, that's the vector j. These are called standard unit vectors. In three space, where the positive x-axis points out at you, here's the positive y-axis, positive z-axis, in three space, you talk about i, which is one zero zero, j, which is zero one zero, and k, which is zero zero one, that's in three space, that's in calc three. Really, analytic geometry three. Again, math 252. This class over here. All right, anyway. Uh, and we often use this notation in physics. Uh, so for example, three-fifths, four-fifths can be written as three-fifths i plus four-fifths j. If you don't see that, uh, let's do this example. Uh, what if we wanted to show the deal with the vector three uh, i, plus four J, and I'll put my half arrowheads here, three I plus four J. We're supposed to distinguish between scalars and vectors, remember. So what's the deal here? All right, uh, I'll put the vector I in mm, green. Let's put the vector I in green. The vector I, remember, okay, is the vector angle brackets, one comma zero. It takes you one unit east. Let's start the origin, all right? So here's a vector i, okay? Copy him, here's another vector i. Copy him, here's another vector i. So here's i plus, okay, so here's, uh, hmm. Imagine these are bold face here. I'll make them bold face. I, okay, so here's I, one comma zero, here's I, and then plus I, right, this head to this tail, I plus I plus I. So we're walking one unit east, and then one unit east, and then one unit east, together, right, I plus I plus I is going to be three I. How about four J? I'll put J in, hmm, turquoise. So here's the vector j. j is the vector 0, 1. Right? So here's j. Right. Here's the vector j, 0, 1. Let's do four more copies. Three more copies. Another j. Another j. Another j. All right. So J plus J plus J plus J, that's four times J, all right? That's four J. This whole thing here is going to be four J. So what's three I? That's like a big vector here, right? Three I, three I is like this big vector here, all right? Plus four J, 
four j is this big vector here, right? What's three i plus four j? We get the resultant vector, three i plus four j. I'll erase these now. Three i plus four j gets us three i plus four j. Okay, which is this guy here, three i plus four j. Or angle brackets. Three angle brackets, three comma four. Right. So that's how a physicist thinks as an addition of these sort of component vectors here, right? A, a physicist, I guess, like to think in terms of adding forces or displacements. Right. I, I, okay, finally, I want to make a final comment regarding, uh, oh, oh, I want to make two final comments. For one thing, in Math 254, linear algebra, here's the game you play. Let's say instead of i and j, you use as your key unit vector. In fact, they don't even have to be unit vectors. Let's say you use this vector and this vector as the basis for your coordinate grid. Okay. And I'm, I'm going I'm to rotate this a little bit. Let's, let's uh, rotate this a little bit. All right. So we get a coordinate grid that looks like this. Okay, so then we can ask questions like, all right, let's say the origin is here, all right? How do we get from this point to this point using these as grid lines? How many of these vectors plus how many of these vectors am I going to need? That's the kind of question you ask in Math 254. You're basically re-coordinatizing the plane. Another issue, where do we see these unit vectors in Calc 3, in Math 252? In directional derivatives, I'm going to explain this. What are directional derivatives? Derivatives. All right. Let's say that you look at a contour map, right? You can imagine axes here. You're looking at a contour map. Uh, and let's say that this contour, this level curve, corresponds to a height or altitude on a mountain of 3,000 feet. So this here represents 3,000 feet. Okay. And then another contour, another level curve inside here, right? Let's say that the altitude or height that corresponds to that is 4,000 feet. Let's say that the peak of the mountain is right here, right? There's the peak of the mountain. So here's the idea. Let's say that on your map here, you're starting at this point, okay? Uh, maybe the elevation is 3,500 feet here at this point on the map. Okay, on your compass, you see that you're going in this direction, okay? What is the directional derivative of the height or altitude, altitude of the mountain if you walk in this direction on your map, if you walk northeast on your map? So it's a measure of how steep the mountain is from this point that you're at, a directional derivative. And that formula involves a unit vector, the unit vector in the direction of this vector that you're interested in. Basically, the unit vector in the direction that you're interested in, right? You have a compass of radius one, all right? Everything's standardized. So if you give me a direction, then I know what vector you you're talking about. Again, it's a standardization. So we talk about directional derivatives in the direction in, in certain directions, right? So the directional derivative in this direction might be positive 10 feet per meter. Uh, if by meter you mean meters along the map. In the opposite direction, the directional derivative would be negative 10 feet per meter. Okay, if again, we're talking about uh, height or altitude being measured in meters along the mountain, and uh, I'm sorry, height or altitude being measured in feet along the mountain, and, and distances along the map being measured in meters. I'm trying to distinguish between the two measures. Uh, heights or altitudes along the mountain and meters along the map. Directional derivatives, and it involves formulas with unit vectors, which indicate direction. If you give me a unit vector, you're basically telling me a direction on your compass. What's the directional derivative in a direction? How, how uh, fast, how steep, how fast is the mountain sloping up? How steep is the mountain? From this point in this way and the and the steeper you climb in this direction the harder you fall 
if you fall in the opposite direction. So mountain climbing and contour maps. Calc 3, map to 52. And I'm going to play a little bit of the next video where I clarify some things. Hi, everyone. Uh, at the end of 6.3, I was talking about level curves in a contour map for heights of a mountain. Uh, the idea is that if you lift this level curve up by 3,000 feet, if you lift this level curve up by 4,000 feet, and so forth, the idea is that you construct the mountain, right? Uh, where z, the height of the mountain, is given as a function of x, the longitude, and y, the latitude. z is a function of x and y. That's calc three. <laughs> All right, let's go to six. Okay, so I guess that was that, that was the stat for that. All right, so we'll take a ten minute break. I have eight eighteen right now. Okay, so here's the plan. Okay, so come back from the break at eight twenty nine. I'll remember remember to mute. Okay, and I'll record questions in chat. All right, I'll see you at eight twenty nine. I'll talk more about vectors and go on some uh, some really cool stuff. And uh, uh, Khan Academy has some cool stuff. All right, some nice videos at the end, including The Simpsons. All right, so I'll see you then, 829. All right, 6.4. Hi, everyone. Uh, at the end of 6.3, I was talking about level curves in a contour map for heights of a mountain. Uh, the idea is that if you lift this level curve up by 3,000 feet, if you lift this level curve up by 4,000 feet and so forth, the idea is that you construct a mountain, right? Uh, where z, the height of the mountain, is given as a function of x, the longitude, and y, the latitude. Z is a function of x and y. That's calc three. <laughs> All right, let's go to 6.4, vectors and dot products. How do we multiply vectors? Uh, there are several ways to do it. The two most common ways is the dot product, which we're going to talk about here in 6.4. And you got to make these dots nice and big, so it's not like a wimpy three times four kind of dot <laughs> from arithmetic. A nice big dot for the dot product or Euclidean inner product. And there's also the cross product, which we're going to see in chapter eight. Okay, that's like a big X there. So yes, the, no the notations aren't very creative. It's like you're making them bigger. <laughs> Okay, the cross product is also called the vector product. We'll see that in chapter eight when we do determinants. Okay, dot products, the subject of section 6.4. This is one way to multiply vectors. So let's say you have two vectors in Cartesian component form. Uh, it's very common in a math 200 level class to say, let the vector V be angle brackets, V sub one comma V sub two, where these are real scalars, real numbers. And the vector w is angle brackets w sub 1 comma w sub 2, where these are in the reals and they're scalars. Uh, then the dot product of these two vectors, in fact, in either order, we'll see that, uh, the dot product v dot w, it's a nice big dot there, right? Uh, not like your wimpy three times four kind of dot. <laughs> okay, got to make it bigger, make it clear it's a dot product between these two vectors. Because we don't take dot products uh, uh, between a scalar and a vector. We take a dot product between a vector and a vector. V dot W, it's going to be this number times this number plus this number times this number. It's kind of the product of the X's plus the product of the Y's. It's this product plus this product. And there are different ways of writing this. You add the products of corresponding components. And notice, when you take the dot product of two vectors, uh, they're really the only things we take the dot product of. Uh, and these are vectors in the plane. Okay, uh, these each have two components. You better have the same number of components. Uh, in Math 252, you have to worry about that. But here, we're assuming that we're dealing with vectors in the plane. Each vector has two components here, right? Uh, when you take the dot product of these two vectors, notice that here, is this a vector or a scalar? Number times number plus number times number. Notice that the value of a dot product is a scalar. A dot product between two vectors is a scalar. So you could write it like this. A vector, big dot, <laughs> vector gives you 
a scalar. Remember that. Assuming these are compatible, and they will be compatible in our class. Uh, these will be vectors in the plane, not three space. Although you could take uh, the dot product between two vectors in three space, but they have to be compatible. <laughs> okay, so for example, how do we take the dot product of seven comma three and two comma negative four? Well, it's seven times two plus three times negative four. In fact, when I work out dot products, um, I find it easier to do the products in my head and write them down and then perform the addition, or in this case, ultimately, the subtraction. Uh, because I, personally, I, I often miswrite things when I try to write down a product as seven times two. Uh, but either way, uh, if you help yourself by writing this all out, that's fine. Uh, if you're like me and you're, you're worried about miswriting things, you might want to do products in your head. In any case, seven times two is 14. Right? Uh, three times negative four is negative 12. 14 plus negative 12, that's 14 minus 12. The dot product is the scalar, two. That's a scalar, not a vector. Again, the dot product between two compatible vectors is a scalar, not a vector. Again, uh, one of the hardest kinds of problems you get on a vector test is, here's an expression with scalars and vectors in it. Is the end result going to be a scalar, a vector, or neither, like it's undefined? And these are hard for students. All right. What are some properties of the dot product? And why do we call it a product? In what sense is it a product? What are some similarities between this guy and say three times four? Products between real numbers and standard multiplication. All right, so, uh, and of course, don't worry about the numbering. Property number one, the dot product, uh, like the regular product for uh, real numbers, is commutative, meaning that the order doesn't matter. V dot W, is equal to w dot v, which makes sense. Uh, and in a proof, you actually show this with symbols in a math 200 level class, but you basically show that if you switch the v1 and the w1, if you switch the v2 and the w2, it doesn't matter. So basically, the commutativity of the dot product uh, relies on the commutativity of standard multiplication for real numbers. And again, uh, these proofs are straightforward in a math 200 level class. So that's one way that this is similar to an old school product. Now, uh, I didn't list property number two. Uh, property number two is basically a, uh, uh, a zero product property. So uh, uh, here's property number two. Uh, property number two is the fact that the zero vector, uh, remember that the zero vector here is zero comma zero, we represent it with a point. The zero vector, see that notation? The zero vector dot any vector in the plane is going to give us, well, zero times a number plus zero times a number, you're going to get zero. Ah, the scalar zero. I'll keep bringing this down. The scalar zero. So the zero vector dot prodded with any vector in the plane in either order, you can switch these by commutativity, uh, the result is going to be the scalar zero with no half arrowhead on top. <laughs> See, that's why it's confusing. A vector dot a vector is a scalar. <laughs> okay, in the same way that in classic multiplication, the scalar zero times any real number like two gets you zero back. Also, just like old school, the dot product distributes over vector addition. Okay. Uh, you may remember that in old school algebra, the number A times the sum B plus C, okay, we can write this as A times B plus A times C. Old school multiplication distributed over addition. Similarly, the vector A dot producted with the vector B plus C, remember, a vector plus a vector is a vector, assuming these are vectors in the plane. Uh, that will go without saying in our class. The result can be obtained by doing a dot d, sorry, a dot b plus a dot c. The dot product distributes over vector addition. And again, whether you work it out this way or this way, you're going to get the same result, which is a scalar, because ultimately we're dealing with a dot product. 
or in this case, a sum of dot products. So the end result will be the sca a scalar, the same real number for both sides. Okay. Property four. Uh, now the closest property we have in old school algebra is the fact that uh, a times a old school was just a squared. Now, with vectors, the vector v dot producted with itself. Now, we can't use the notation v squared because it's not clear what the nature of the squaring is. Because a square means you're doing v times v. But what kind of product are you talking about? Here, it's clear that we're talking about a dot product. But we never say v squared when v is a vector because you're not being clear what the nature of the product is. Is it a dot product, a cross product? What is it? So we never say v squared when v is a vector, right? Uh, v dot v, it turns out, is going to be the square of the length or magnitude of v. Okay. And by the way, uh, this is a scalar, right? Uh, uh, the dot product of two vectors is a scalar. This is, <laughs> again, a scalar. Okay. You can think of it in terms of the Pythagorean theorem, maybe, right? Imagine an isosceles triangle, an isosceles uh, right triangle, right? It's kind of like the idea there, kind of like the idea. Um, okay, so uh, v dot v equals the magnitude of v squared. Uh, so the idea here in terms of computation, so you have angle vector v1, v2, okay, that product it with v1, dot v2, okay. v1 times v1 is v1 squared plus v2 plus v2 is v2 squared. And, and that's how I related it to the right triangle. In case you were wondering what I was doing, I was relating that to a right triangle where I was saying, okay, if this is uh, uh, v1, this is v, sorry. If this is v1, if this is v2, the vector v1 comma v2 is this vector here, the vector v. So uh, v1 squared plus v2 squared, the sum of the squares of the legs, that gives us the square of the hypotenuse, the square of the length of v. So if you want to think of this as a length, we're talking about the length of v, the magnitude, or r. Okay, both of these sides will equal uh, the square of the hypotenuse. All right. Next up, we're going to talk about a key application of dot products, finding the angle between two vectors. Next time. Okay, by the way, a couple of things here. First of all, I think I may have misstated. We, we don't need an isosceles. Hold on, hold on a second. Uh, let, me, let me go back to here. Okay. You can think of it in terms of the Pythagorean theorem, maybe, right? Imagine an isosceles triangle. Well, a right triangle. Yeah, it didn't have to be isosceles. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, yeah, so uh, v, v2 times v2, not v2 plus v2. That's over here. Yeah, right here. One, v2. Okay, that provided it with v1 dot v2. Okay. V1 times v1 is v1 squared plus v2 plus v2? Uh, is v2, is v2, v2, v2 times v2, right. So those are my two corrections. Um, also, there's a question about uh, maybe the earlier, earlier one um, up here, the first example. So the differences between uh, vectors and scalars, all right? So we have a vector consisting of two scalars, two scalar components, a vector consisting of two scalar components, right? Scalar times scalar is a scalar plus scalar times scalar is a scalar. When you add scalars, that's the scalar. So uh, in the, again, we have a vector containing scalars, dot a vector containing scalars, a vector dot a vector, these are vectors in the plane, gives a scalar. Okay, so uh, any questions about this before we go on? Any questions? Scalars, vectors, dot products, properties of the dot product. Any questions? Oh, you're welcome, yes. Uh, any questions? All right. 
So next, uh, let's let's move on. The square of the hypotenuse. All right. Next up, we're going to talk about a key application of dot products, finding the angle between two vectors. Next time. Hi, everyone. Here's a great application of dot products. We can use it to find the angle between these between two vectors. So let's say that we have two vectors, v and w, uh, neither one being the zero vector, because the zero vector has all angles in a way, right? You can associate any angle to the zero vector. Uh, so uh, let's say we have two vectors, v and w, and they don't even have to be connected. I could just draw a vector v, uh, an arrow like this to represent v, an arrow here to represent w, okay? And I can talk about the angle with the, between two vectors. Now, it might be helpful to, uh, to place their initial points together, like at the origin. So it may be helpful to put the v vector here, the initial point at the origin, the w vector here, the initial point at the origin, uh, to help orient ourselves. And we could talk about the angle between these two vectors. Uh, and in fact, uh, we can take the, the least non-negative angle between these two vectors, the least non-negative angle, okay. uh, which means that the angle can be said to be somewhere between 0 degrees and 180 degrees. Uh, for example, let's say that we have a vector pointing east. Well, if you rotate it over here, right, uh, this guy here is pointing the opposite direction, there's a 180 degree rotation between these two vectors. But if you were to rotate this a bit more, counterclockwise, so it's like that. See, back in chapter four, we might have said that uh, this was like a 200-something degree angle. Uh, but no, uh, if the vectors are in, in, in these two directions, then this angle here would be taken to be the least non-negative angle between them. Okay, so this here. Uh, we take this uh, counterclockwise angle, positive angle, from here to here. Okay, so in that sense, the angle between two vectors can always be said to be between zero degrees and 180 degrees. And we're assuming they're non-zero because the zero vector, again, has all angles associated with it. Uh, kind of like uh, if you take the Earth, right? The North Pole of the Earth is on all possible longitude lines. Okay, anyway, <clears throat> let's say that this angle is theta. We remember him. Let's call this angle theta between the two vectors. Okay, uh, don't confuse that between uh, the direction angle. Uh, although you could get theta by taking the direction angles for the two vectors and subtracting. You could do that. Uh, but uh, we're going to use this formula. Theta is the angle between the two vectors. So cosine of theta is given by this formula. And a great way to remember it, it's the dot product, v dot w, in either order, right? In fact, I don't care which one you call v, which, call, which one you call w, right? Uh, this could be v this could be W, or vice versa, it's going to be the same angle, right? Commutativity, we can switch these. It's the dot product over the product of the lengths. And again, you could switch these. But don't switch the top and the bottom. <laughs> right. It's the dot product over the product of the lengths. The, the dot product is a scalar, and lengths are scalars. And we're assuming that we don't have the zero vector for V or W, so uh, these guys will not be zero. The dot product can be zero. We'll see that later. But we know the lengths will not be zero. Okay, so the cosine of theta is given by this formula, the dot product over the product of the lengths. Uh, there's something called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which guarantees that this will always spit out a value between negative one and one. Which means, uh, by the way, when you, when you apply inverse cosine, because uh, theta, you might wonder, can we say it's the inverse cosine of this whole jazz over here? And this time, with a blue arrow here, this time the answer is yes. We can use the inverse cosine notation. Now, some books may still hesitate because, remember, many books say that if you have inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent, the results should be written in radians. I don't have that rule. Uh, I'm okay with you using inverse cosine notation and then giving me an answer in degrees. I'm okay with that. Okay, that's the least of our worries, I, I think. 
I'm worried more about quadrants. Now remember, when we were dealing with inverse tangent before, right, uh, we had a potential problem with quadrant. But here we're not going to have a problem because what's the range for inverse cosine? The range for inverse cosine is from zero to pi radians. Or what in degrees? Zero degrees to 180 degrees. So when we apply inverse cosine, we're guaranteed that we're going to get an angle in the appropriate interval. So inverse cosine is perfectly fine, again, assuming that neither of these is the zero vector. And if, like me, you're OK with the answer being given in degree mode, in degree measure. All right, so inverse cosine works perfectly. We don't have any uh, range problems like we could have had with inverse tangent, like we did in that one example. All right. Here's another great thing about the dot product, and it's related to this over here. Uh, by the way, uh, in case you're wondering how it's proven, it's proven from the law of cosines. So it's kind of appropriate that the law of cosines was also in chapter six. This is proven from the law of cosines. All right. A great fact. Two vectors, V and W, are orthogonal. I know that's a tough looking word, but when you see orthogonal, think perpendicular. Orthogonal is a fancy way of saying perpendicular. They're frequently interchangeable. But bear in mind that in Math 254, linear algebra, you're going to define inner products in such a way that you can talk about polynomials being orthogonal. That's kind of mind-blowing. But for right now, geometrically, uh, think of orthogonal as meaning perpendicular. All right, like for example, here's a vector v, and here's an orthogonal vector w. And it turns out that two vectors, uh, in the plane are orthogonal or perpendicular if and only if the dot product in either order is the scalar zero. Uh, by the way, this works for three space also if these vectors are in three space. So remember, uh, for non-zero vectors, these lengths cannot be zero, but the dot product could be zero. That happens if and only if the dot product is zero, uh, if and only if the, the uh, vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular. It's a nice test for perpendicularity or orthogonality if the dot product is zero. Now, let's see why that is. Uh, you can get it from the nature of this formula, okay? Cosine of theta, I'm going to go ahead and erase a lot of these annotations here. <laughs> kind of a mess, right? Okay, let's focus on this formula. Cosine of theta equals the dot product or the product of the lengths, all right? Now, here's the deal. Uh, these vectors are non-zero. We know that lengths, if they're not zero, they're going to be positive, right? Lengths are positive. Magnitudes are positive. Which means that the sine of cosine of theta is determined entirely by the sine of the dot product. And the cosine of theta will be zero if and only if the dot product is zero, because uh, these pieces down here are both positive. The sine of this is the same as the sine of this, S-I-G-N, or they're both zero. Well, let's think about cosine values, right? Uh, so again, what I'm saying here is that uh, the cosine of theta has the same sign as the dot product between the two vectors, all right? So let's remember the deal. In chapter four, in chapter four, Okay, let's say we have an acute angle. If we have a quadrant one angle, all right, then uh, what is the sine of cosine? Cosine is positive. Also, cosine of zero degrees is one. Okay, it's also positive for this quadrantal angle. Cosine of 90 degrees is zero. Remember, COS, <laughs> COS, cosine of 90 degrees is zero up here, right? And what's the sine, S-I-G-N, of cosine in quadrant two. What's the x coordinate in quadrant two? It's going to be negative. And the cosine of 180 degrees is negative one. So cosine is negative for this quadrantal angle. And we're only worried about angles, remember, between zero degrees and 180 degrees, right? Uh, we're saying that the angle between two vectors can be said to be somewhere in here. So what that means is that I'll put this in green. That means that cosine of theta 
is positive if and only if if and only if the angle between the two vectors is quadrant one, uh, in particular, acute, strictly between zero degrees and 90 degrees. Uh, or it could be a zero degree angle because cosine of zero is positive one. By the way, what does it mean for the angle between two vectors to be zero degrees? Let's say we have an angle, uh, sorry, a vector here. Let's say we have a vector here. Draw for me an arrow representing a vector that makes a zero degree angle with this vector. Basically, draw for me a vector that makes a zero degree angle with this vector. Any vector that points in the same direction. And by the way, the zero vector is orthogonal to everybody, right? You could have talked about the zero vector, but the zero vector has all possible angles, right? Um, we, we're focusing on non-zero vectors. Uh, if you have two vectors pointing in the same direction, so they're parallel and pointing in the same direction, then the uh, dot product will be positive, right? In that case also. Or you have an acute angle between them. So the cosine of theta, that is the dot product is positive. So when I say the cosine of theta is positive, I'm also saying that the dot product is positive in the case where the angle is acute or if there's a zero degree difference, meaning that they're pointing in the same direction. All right, now what about the case where cosine of theta is negative? If cosine of theta is negative, uh, I'll do this in orange. Cosine of theta is negative if and only if the angle is obtuse, strictly between 90 degrees and 180 degrees, right? A quadrant two obtuse angle. Or remember, cosine of 180 degrees is negative one, that quadrantal angle. Uh, or we have a 180 degree angle. So we have two angles that, we have two vectors that either form an obtuse angle, like so, or there's a 180 degree angle between the two vectors. By the way, folks, these are fair test questions, for, so pay attention. What does it mean for a vector to form a 180 degree angle with a vector like that? The vector has to point in the opposite direction. Now see, in both cases, in, in this case here, oops, in this case here, and in this case, in this case here, the pairs of vectors are parallel in both cases. If they point in the same direction, the angle between them is zero degrees. If they point in opposite directions, the angle between them is 180 degrees, okay? So it's not enough to say that two vectors are parallel. <laughs> All right, anyway. Oh, and what happens if the cosine of theta is zero? Do that in red. That was the key point here, right? That was the most important case, right? If the cosine of theta is zero, if the cosine of theta is zero, right? That means the dot product is zero, okay? That means the, uh, uh, and by the way, this is also a statement on dot product, right? Uh, Over here, cosine of theta is zero. That is the dot product is zero, right? Remember that we got that from this formula here. Cosine of theta is zero if and only if the dot product is zero for non-zero vectors, okay? The cosine is zero if and only if the angle is, C-O-S, 90 degrees. We have a right angle between them, which means that they're what O word? The two vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular. That's when the cosine of theta is zero, that's when the dot product is zero. So here's a great application of dot product. The sign of the dot product, okay, just by getting the dot product, you can find the nature of the angle between them. If I have two non-zero vectors, V and W, and you take their dot product, V dot W, if the dot product is positive, the angle between them is acute or zero degrees. They point in the same direction. If the angle between them Oh, sorry, if the dot product is negative, that means the angle between them is obtuse, or they point, as, they point in opposite directions, 180 degrees. If the dot product is zero, that means you have a right angle. Again, that's this over here. Two non-zero vectors have a, have a zero dot product if and only if they are orthogonal or perpendicular. Great rule.
And again, the sign of the dot product tells you the sign, S-I-G-N, of the angle between them, right off the bat. The sign of the cosine of the angle. But what if we want the actual angle? Okay, let's go through the formula. Find the angle between these two vectors. Uh, it's helpful to think of them as position vectors, represented as position vectors, using equal scaling on the axes so we can visualize angles. Two comma one, kind of flat, right? And negative two comma negative three, that's a bit steeper, okay? We have a quadrant one uh, vector and a quadrant three vector, if you think of them as position vectors. So you can see the angle between them if we drew these kind of right, we're guessing we're going to get an obtuse angle between these. Now, I didn't draw them very accurately, but just from a quick sketch, I think we're going to get an obtuse angle. Again, you need equal scaling uh, to have a good sense of what the nature of the angle is. Uh, if, you have equals, if you have unequal scales, you can distort pictures. Remember, if you have unequal scales, then this could be a square with perpendicular diagonals. <laughs> so be careful. If you want to visualize angles, you better have equal scales on these axes. All right. Well, here's a more accurate sketch. <laughs> I did it freehand. It turns out that if you do graph these position vectors, yeah, you can see visually the angle would be obtuse. Notice that I have equal scales on the two axes. Very important if you want to try to visualize angles. I mean, parallel will stay parallel, but you can't even determine perpendicular vectors if you don't use equal scaling. All right. Let's work this formula. The cosine of theta equals the dot product over the product of the lengths. Here, I indicate what V and W are. I'm just plugging them in. How do you find a dot product? Okay, uh, as work, you should tell me what the dot product is. It's this times this plus this times this. What's two times negative two? It's negative four. What's one times negative three? It's negative three. Again, uh, I like to write down the products instead of going two times two and so, two times negative two and so on. See that? I, I often miswrite things. So I like to uh, do the products in my head. Two times negative two is negative four. One times negative three is negative three. And then you combine. Negative four minus three is negative seven. That's the dot product. And notice, this is negative. So right off the bat, what can we say? The dot product is negative. So that means that right off the bat, we know that the angle is going to be obtuse, right? Because cosine is negative in quadrant two. Okay, the angle is going to be obtuse. Or they point in opposite directions. But uh, the thing is, uh, these are not scalar multiples of each other. So they're not parallel. They're not scalar multiples of each other. So the, we know the angle is going to be obtuse, okay, which we can see from our sketch picture. Well, my sketch or from a computer. <laughs> okay, these lengths, remember, it's Pythagorean, the square root of two squared plus one squared, all right, times the square root of the square of negative two. Remember, squares are never negative. The square of negative two is positive four. Put the grouping symbols here, plus the square of negative three, okay? This here is root negative five, sorry, root five, <laughs> Better not be negative five. Uh, this here is root five. This here is root 13. All right. Now, you could work this out, but be careful. There's a double division here. You're dividing negative seven by this and this. So it might be better to multiply the radicals. That does work. Uh, root five times root 13 is root, five times 13 is 65. That does work. For some reason, I rounded off here, but uh, that's a bad idea. I, I shouldn't have done that. Whatever this is, keep the decimal approximation on your calculator, all these sync things. It won't be exact, but it'll be very accurate. I shouldn't have rounded here. Okay, uh, don't round off unnecessarily in the middle. Anyway, cosine of theta turns out to be this negative number, right? Ah, what button do you put on your calculator? You see a number like this in your display with more sync things? Cosine of theta equals these guys here, right? What button do you press to get theta itself? You want the inverse cosine or arc cosine. And make sure you're in degree mode because we want to express our, uh, our angles in degree measure, usually, 
in chapter six. All right, so theta, and remember, you can use the inverse cosine notation. Uh, I say it's okay to give your answer in degree mode. Uh, books may object because they usually like to have these results in radiant measure. I say this is okay. The inverse cosine of this guy, right? All right, and you get about 150.3 degrees, which is what kind of angle? It's an obtuse angle. And it seems to be consistent with our picture here. It makes sense that this is about 150 degrees, right? 150.3 degrees. That's the angle that separates these two vectors. Whether you orient them as position vectors, if you use those, whether you use those representations or not. Remember, uh, I can take, I can move this vector here, move this vector here, and the angle between these two vectors will still be this here. So using dot products to find the angle between two vectors. Next, we'll talk about applications to physics. Oh, okay, so any questions? Any questions? Uh, I will admit that uh, uh, at this point, we're done with everything that you need for the homework. Now, I hope that you, you don't run away yet. If you have to, I, I, I understand. But uh, here's a nice physical application of dot products. And then 6.5 is an optional section, but it's really cool. It connects uh, uh, trigonometry and imaginary numbers. It's really cool. And I'm, I'm going to show a Khan Academy video, a little Simpsons clip. So um, although we're done with the homework stuff, uh, you're encouraged to stick around. Okay, let's do an application from physics. Hi, everyone. I'm not going to have you work on work, this physics principle. It's optional in my class. Uh, but here's the idea. The work, W, applied on an object, let's say a brick that you're trying to move along the floor, right? Uh, and let's say that uh, uh, the work applied, you're interested in the work applied on this brick, okay, by a constant force F, so you're pushing it with a constant force, as the object moves along the displacement vector, D, okay, so you want to move the brick from here to here, basically. That's the displacement vector. Now, if you're dealing with a one-dimensional picture where everything's pointing in the same direction, it's a one-dimensional picture, right? Then basically, work equals force times distance, just as scale is, right? Work equals force times distance. But now, what happens if you're on an incline, right? Uh, oh, actually, actually uh, oh, I should say here, uh, even if you're on an incline, even if you're on an incline, as long as the force vector and the displacement vector are pointing in the same direction, well, uh, the work applied is still uh, the magnitude of the force vector times the distance traveled, okay, the length of this displacement vector. Basically, work equals force times distance, but since we're on an incline, we're talking about the magnitude of F times the magnitude of D. Uh, these are vectors. Before, we could get away with treating these as scalars in the one-dimensional case. Uh, here, we have to talk about lengths of vectors. All right. But here's where it gets really interesting. What if there's a helicopter pulling on the object, and there's actually a non-zero angle between these two vectors? Ah, here's the interesting case. Then what's the deal with the work applied? Well, the thing is, um, so if this is the force applied by this helicopter, that's denoted by the length or magnitude of F. The thing is, we care about the aspect of this force in the direction that we're interested in, the direction of the displacement vector. We want to know what the deal is, uh, uh, the impact of work as this object is moved up the incline in this direction. So we care about the aspect of force in this direction. So instead of this vector, we want to look more at the projection vector over here, which is sometimes denoted as PROJ, the projection vector. And the component here is the signed length of the projection vector. Uh, if the helicopter is working against you, the component will be negative, actually. Right. But here, the helicopter is helping you as you drag the object uh, up this incline. It's going in the same general direction as this displacement vector, generally. So uh, basically, what we want to know the signed length of this projection vector over here. If you project the f vector on the d vector, uh, the notation is this. Okay. That vector I'm talking about the projection, whoops, the projection of, keep doing that, the projection of F along D. That's this vector over here, in purple actually, that's this vector. The signed length is called the component of F along D. That's the aspect of the force vector we care about in this direction. 
Well, what's the relationship between this angle, this adjacent side, and this hypotenuse? That sounds like SOKATOA, cosine. It's a cosine relationship. This is given by the hypotenuse times, basically R, cosine of theta. Put this all together, and hey, the product of lengths times the cosine of theta. If you finagle this formula over here, right, uh, cosine of theta is the dot product or the product of the lengths. If you solve this for the dot product, you have a geometric definition for dot product. Before, with the algebraic definition, we said that v dot w was v1 w1 plus v2 w2, algebraic. But now, geometrically, we can say that the dot product is the product of the lengths times the cosine of the angle between them. That's another way of defining a dot product, even in the absence of a coordinate system, really. Okay, so basically, all this, right, uh, work equals the relevant aspect of force, that magnitude, times the distance traveled. It ends up being the dot product. Work is given by the dot product. So that's a key application in physics. Uh, any questions? Again, you don't need that for the homework, but I, I wanted to introduce you to these ideas because you do run into work integrals, for example, in Calc 3. Any questions before we go on to 6.5, which is an interesting connection with imaginary numbers? All right, this is, this is cool stuff, actually. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to do an optional section now, but it's really cool stuff. Trig and Euler, or exponential forms of a complex number. So in the beginning, we were talking about a complex number, z. Uh, it was a plus bi, standard form, a and b are real numbers. Instead of a and b, let's use x and y, x and y, right? So here's standard form for a complex number, z equals x plus yi. Remember, x is our cosine of theta, y is our sine of theta. We got that from earlier in chapter 6, in 6.3. So z equals r cosine of theta, that's x, plus y is r sine of theta, times i, right? Factor out an r, z equals r times, okay, cosine of theta, plus, bring up the i, i sine of theta. And you trig students, those of you who had trig, may remember that cosine of theta plus i sine of theta is sometimes abbreviated as cis of theta. Uh, by the way, this is uh, uh, offered in a handout, both both my notes and in a supplementary handout that I have. Okay, a or x is r cosine of theta, b or y is r sine of theta, right? Uh, r uh, r is sometimes called the modulus. Theta is sometimes called the argument. Okay, r is from the Pythagorean, right? Theta, there's a tangent relationship, so it's a lot like six point three. Okay. Again, I have a, a supplementary handout on my website with this stuff. Uh, but again, back in Math 104, you may recognize we have R CIS of theta, okay? And it turns out that CIS of theta is in fact e to the i theta. And in just a moment, I'm going to show a video from Khan Academy that's going to show this. All right, that's the Euler or exponential form of a complex number. But I'll do that after the recording because I don't know what copyright issues there might be. So basically, uh, here is standard form in Cartesian, z equals x plus y i, where x and y are real, right? Here is polar or trig form, z equals r, basically cis of theta. And then the exponential form or Euler form looks like this, z equals r e to the i theta. Now the fact that these are equal, uh, uh, the Khan Academy video will show you why that is. It gets pretty deep. You're not required to know why, but it's pretty deep. <laughs> It leads on to Calc 2, Calculus 2 on series. All right. Uh, now, one implication for this, well, there are several implications. Uh, for example, uh, you can multiply complex numbers very quickly, in a sense. If all you care is the, um, uh, the uh, values for r and theta, the modulus and the argument, what if we multiply two complex numbers? Ordinarily, uh, you'd have to take guys like these and FOIL, right? like 2 plus 3i and 4 plus 5i, you FOIL and you work that out. It wasn't too bad. But right off the bat, uh, what you can do is in trig form or Euler form, if you multiply two complex numbers, 
you multiply their R values to get the new R value, and you add the theta values to get the new theta value. The reason is, uh, uh, if you multiply two complex numbers, basically, uh, the R values multiply, and it comes from the rules for exponents. Uh, remember, when you multiply powers of E, you add the exponents. That's why you add the arguments. So it comes through algebraically. All right. Uh, in general, okay, if you just care about uh, these moduli and arguments, right, basically the, uh, the distances from the pole, this is called the pole now, the pole or origin, the distance from the pole or origin and this argument or direction angle, all right, Okay, uh, when you multiply two complex numbers, you multiply the R values to get the new R, you add the theta values to get the new theta. For division, divide the R values, subtract the theta values. For powers, you raise R to the power, you multiply with the theta. Roots are more interesting. And in fact, I'll show you something really cool with roots. All right, uh, let's look for a blank sheet here. Where can I get a blank sheet? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I'll get a blank sheet here. All right, over here, the blank sheet. So let's talk about uh, solving complex equations. All right. Uh, let's say that we wanted to solve z to the fourth equals one. Basically, what are the fourth roots of one? If you consider all complex numbers, what to the fourth is one? What to the fourth is one? Well, we have some easy answers. Uh, one to the fourth is one. Also, negative one to the fourth is one. We have two imaginary values that work out. I to the fourth is one. And negative I all to the fourth is one. And looky here, they form the corners of a what? These guys form the corners of a square. We have rotational symmetry. You go around 90 degrees. Every time you multiply by I, you uh, multiply by, you, you, uh, you rotate by 90 degrees. And you can verify that from the Euler forms. It's because, it's because I corresponds to a 90 degree angle. When you multiply by I, you keep adding 90 degrees to the argument or direction angle. Uh, now in general, uh, what if I consider, uh, how about this? What if I had considered, um, let's see here. What if I consider, z to the fifth equals one. Uh, okay, z to the fifth equals one. All right, so we consider z to the fifth equals one. What are the fifth roots gonna look like? Well, one to the fifth is one. And this time, we're going to form not a square, we're going to form a pentagon. So here's the first fifth root, second, third, fourth, fifth. Remember, okay, if we subtract one from both sides, we get a fifth degree polynomial with real coefficients. This guy has how many complex zeros or roots from the fundamental theorem of algebra? This guy has five complex zeros, just like this guy had four complex zeros. Boom, 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 right? Uh, or, or well, you know, z to the fourth, if you write this as z to the fourth minus one equals zero, right? We have four complex zeros or roots to that polynomial. Likewise, over here, for this polynomial, we have five complex roots. Only one of them is real. There's only one real fifth root of one Okay, the other four fifth roots are imaginary. And what about, what's the deal with this guy and this guy? These two imaginary roots form a pair of what? Remember, here's the real axis. Here's the imaginary axis. These two guys form a pair of complex conjugates. Remember that rule? If you have a polynomial with real coefficients, okay, then, then, the, uh, then if, one, if one complex number is a zero, 
then so is its complex conjugate. A real number is its own complex conjugate. Right? Again, complex conjugate pair over here. So the five fifth roots of one, which correspond to the five complex zeros or roots for this polynomial, they correspond to this one real value, this one real fifth root, and these two pairs of complex conjugate pairs. Really lovely, really, really lovely. Right. In general, if you consider more generally, uh, like, let's consider this over here. Consider uh, solving this. Solve z to the fourth equals 16i. Or you can subtract 16i from both sides. z to the fourth minus 16i equals zero. Now, this guy does not have all real coefficients, all right? But still true that 16i has four complex fourth roots, right? It has four complex fourth roots, five complex fifth roots, and so forth. That's still true. And it turns out that if you work out the four complex fourth roots of 16i, by the way, they're all two units away from the pole or origin. Once again, these four fourth roots of 16i form the corners of a square. But the complex conjugate rule doesn't work anymore because um, uh, 16i or negative 16i, that's not a real coefficient. So we're not getting the complex conjugate pairs like we did before. We're still getting the corners of a square. Likewise, uh, the five fifth roots of 16i will form the corners of a regular pentagon. Okay? In general, the n complex nth roots for any non-zero complex number will form the corners of a regular n-gon. <laughs> okay, like it could be a regular pentagon, right? It could be a regular pentagon. For, for sixth roots, it will be a regular hexagon, and so forth. So that's all pretty cool. But that won't be on your homework or exams. It's cool stuff, though, this rotational symmetry. Here's Khan Academy. Okay, myself off there. Okay. Uh, actually, first off, let me show you a very quick clip from The Simpsons. Right. And here's Desmos. All right. So here's Khan Academy. All right. Here's Khan Academy. Whoa, this is Calc 2, right? But here's the thing. So this here is a series expansion for e to the x. Uh, a series here, this, is, this series looks like an infinite polynomial. It has infinitely many terms. Uh, this here is a series. Uh, by the way, uh, in chapter nine, we're going to talk about factorial. For example, three factorial, like three exclamation point or four exclamation point, four factorial, four exclamation point. That's four times three times two times one. And then five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. We'll talk about these in chapter nine. Series for cosine of x. This here is a series for sine of x. Now, uh, so if you take many terms and you plug in values for x, you get an approximation. Uh, now, if you don't believe me, let's build this up. Let's look at sine of x. Uh, I claim that sine of x looks like this infinite polynomial. This is a series. Let's go term by term. I'm going to build it up term by term. Here's our old friend. Oh, I, I should put in, in projector mode. All right. Here's our old friend y equals sine of x, the sine wave, right? Let's look at the origin when x is zero. Let's look at the origin. What's the, what's the best linear approximation to the graph near the origin? What's, it's the tangent line given by y equals x. That's the first term in the series. What if we take the first two terms? That's in black. See, it's starting to hug the red sine wave a bit more. What if I take the first three terms in the series for sine of x? This is calc two. That's in red. How about the first four terms? That's in blue. It's hugging the curve more and more. By the way, factorial means it's like, you know, three factorial is three times two times one. We'll review that. Five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. We'll review that. But these series, notice, as you take more terms, we're going to hug this sine wave more and more as we go outside. Same for cosine. Okay. At zero, one. Projector uh, mode, right? At zero, one. All right, this point here, the tangent line is flat. All right, if we zoom in, right, if we zoom in, the, the cosine curve looks really flat up there, right? Okay, so the, co so the tangent line is flat up there. How about if we take the first two terms of the series? 
Okay, we're getting that parabola, right? It's a nice fit. Best quadratic approximation near this y-intercept, right? How about the first three terms? That's a good fourth degree guy. It's hugging that cosine curve better and better. How about the first four terms? Sixth degree. That's the best sixth degree approximation near the point, right? So uh, as we take more and more terms, right, it's like we're getting a, a, a higher and higher degree polynomial, and we're going to fit this cosine wave better and better as we start moving outward. And we get really good approximations near 0, 1. Now, this is called a, a, a Maclaurin series, uh, a Maclaurin series. It's, it's a Taylor series centered at x equals 0. All right. Now, uh, let's, talk, let's talk about why. Um, uh, e to the ix was cis of x. Remember that, Jazz? Khan's going to explain. So, uh, no, now here's the deal. I'm going to pause the recording. Yeah, I'm going to pause now. And well, uh, not all for now, because I'm going to go to Khan before we end. This year, here's a nice little thing. I can email this out about Euler's identity. Again, e, i, pi, 1, and 0. I can email that out. And uh, i to the i is a real number. i to the i is e to the negative pi over 2. And that can be proven through Euler's formula. Go through this. Um, normally, there's an r in front. Uh, and uh, it corresponds to the fact that if you're looking at uh, i, right? If you're looking at i, i can be expressed like this because it corresponds to the case where uh, you have the complex number that's one unit away from the pole and it corresponds to an angle of pi over 2. e to the i theta equals all this. i to the i turns out to be e to the negative pi over 2, which is real. That's kind of freaky. Take a look at this when I send this out. All right, so that's that for today. All right, uh, I will stick around for questions. So that finishes chapters 5 and 6. This last part was optional. All right, so have a good weekend. I, I will stick around for questions. I, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. I can't seem to, well, for 5.21e, I don't know how to start it. And then for 1f, I'm getting towards the end, but I just am getting stumped. Like, I don't know if I'm doing it right. Okay, so let's, let's start with that. Okay, and by the way, I'm continuing the recording, but if anyone objects to the recording, I can pause it. Okay, but I think students really appreciate the recordings. All right, so let's proceed. And again, for those of you who are going, have a good night and have a great weekend. Um, uh, okay, so, okay. And this, this will be posted on the YouTube video. All right. Uh, so, sorry, you're, you're, we're doing what number again? 5.21e. I don't, I don't know how, even how to start it. Ah, uh, yes, okay. And by the way, B, C, and D, I think, are in other pieces. All right. Uh, 5 .2. Yeah, I uh, did those. Yeah, let me, let me grab the, my... my uh, Move over here. All right. These little zoom pieces can get in the way sometimes. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. So five, two, one, E. Right, right, right. And this is related to something I did on the handout when I went over the handout. Okay, so 521E. It's like when I was kind of verifying one of the half angle identities. All right. So let's start on the left side, go to the right side. Okay. So I'm going to start by saying start with the LHS left hand side. You should always indicate which side you're starting at. All right. Okay. So over here, uh, oh, I'm going to get my uh, tablet. Hold on. But the idea here is to use trig conjugates. See if you remember that little trick, the idea of trig conjugates. Okay, so the left-hand side equals, I'm going to put a, whoops, I'm going to put a, uh, let's see, make this purple. I'm going to put a big radical here, big radical. 
Okay, I'm going to copy what's over here. One minus cosine of theta all over one plus cosine of theta times, and then uh, and you know just for good measure, um, even though these aren't necessary, these are good visually for students. I'd go ahead and put brackets here, some sort of grouping symbol. I think that's helpful. All right. Now, uh, it might be natural for people to do the trig conjugate trick here, where you multiply by one minus cosine of theta and one minus cosine of theta up on top. Now, you might be going, why not put the plus case? Why not take the trig conjugate at the top? Well, here's the rationale. So uh, it's not just a matter of using the trig conjugate because it's an available tool. In a way, it's a last resort, actually, because you tend to make things worse. Here, it is the way, though, all right? So take a look at the target. It's good to aim for the target. Okay, now, basically, on the top, we're removing the radical, okay? So... What are you inclined to do? Well, here's kind of a hint. I'll, I'll do this in blue. If, what can I do to root x to get x alone, all right? Well, assuming x is non-negative, we can square this. In other words, root x times root x, if x is non-negative, is gonna be x itself, all right? Now, the thing is, I know a lot of students are tempted to square this left-hand side, but the thing is, you have no right to square uh, a guy just because you feel like it. Because for example, is it always true that A is equal to A squared? Well, no, that's not always true, okay? Th these are not generally equivalent, right? You can't just square something because you feel like it. But what can I always do? I can always multiply by one, okay? And why multiply one like this? Okay, not just because it's a, it's a nice trick conjugate trick, but because the goal is that we want to remove the radical on the top so we get the, uh, this guy here all alone. And then down here, it looks like we're forcing what identity, whose identities? Well, maybe you didn't invent them, but basically the Pythagorean identities, which means that this kind of format may help because it's forcing squares. Right. Uh, again, this is very similar to what I did on the, uh, on the handout for, tri for a verify for verifying one of the half angle identities. Okay, so equals. So what happens underneath here? Well, a guy times himself is just the guy squared, right? So we take one minus cosine of theta, all that squared. And no, you don't have to work out the square, as we'll see. Over here, okay, you square the first guy, one minus. So square the second guy. Remember, if you have a sum times a difference of the same two guys, you take the square of the first guy minus the square of the second guy, right? Uh, a plus B, A minus B, this is A squared minus B squared. All right, any questions so far? Any questions so far? Questions, questions. Okay, now there are different ways that you can approach this. Uh, so for example, you can look at it this way. We have the square root of one minus cosine of theta, all squared, all over the square root of one minus cosine squared of theta. So in breaking up the radical, you can do that, assuming that you're dealing with, well, let's say positive pieces. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to my next page here. All right, uh, and remember we're trying to hit that target. Where's the target?
why can't I get my, <laughs> right here, right hand side. Okay, <laughs> we're aiming for that. All right, so we're up to here. Any questions, any questions? All right, now over here, Okay, so for the top here, here's the idea. What is the square root of x squared? The square root of x squared. A lot of students want to say x, but in general, you want to say the absolute value of x, all right? So what's happening down here? It's like all this stuff here, the whole base of that square. This is all x, all right. So the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. So on the top, we're gonna to get the absolute value of one minus cosine of theta all over the square root of, well, what is one minus cosine squared theta? Based on Mr. Pythagoras, it's going to be sine squared theta. Okay, these guys add up to one, so one minus one of the guys equals the other. Wait, so why would the top be in the absolute value? Yeah. Absolute value? Oh, yeah. Again, it's because of um, this old technicality from chapter zero. Okay. I did mention this before, way back in chapter zero. But, of course, many students, uh, it's a distant memory, I know. Okay. So the square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. Because let me give an example. If you have x equals negative 3. What's the square root of the square of negative three? Well, the answer is not negative three because here's the deal. What's the square of negative three? It's, pos it's positive nine. And what's the principal square root of nine? It's three, which is not the negative three over here. It's its absolute value, right? So the square root of x squared equals the absolute value of x. And that's true for all x in the reals, all of them. Questions, questions. So that explains the absolute value on the top. Okay, but eventually they're removed. I'll explain that in a moment. Okay, so equals absolute value. Uh, I'm going to go to yeah. Let me go to purple. I know they're close anyway. But let's do it. Go back to purple. Okay, so equals absolute value one minus cosine of theta. All over, once again, absolute value of sine of theta, where sine of theta takes on the rule of x. All right. Any questions so far? Questions so far? We're, we're almost done. We're basically there, except that I want to justify why it is that we can remove absolute value, as you've kind of noted, right? Okay. We are claiming that this is equal to, we don't need the absolute value up there in the end. Check it though. One minus cosine of theta all over absolute value of sine of theta, and I say you're done there. Although it would be helpful to show a bit of, uh, make a comment here, right? Why is it okay for us to remove absolute value? All right, so here's my claim. Kind of a side claim. All right, claim. So I claim that the absolute value of, uh, I'll, I'll claim this, the absolute value of A is itself provided that it's non negative, right? You agree that the absolute value of something non-negative or something guaranteed to be non-negative is going to equal itself, all right, again, if A is non-negative in value. But here's my claim. Here's really my claim, actually. It, is Go it ahead. because cosine is even? Well, no, it's, it's more of a range issue. It's more of a range issue. So here's the deal. What's the deal with the absolute value of 1 minus cosine of theta. And by the way, this kind of analysis is very routine in calculus. Well, tell me, what's the range for cosine of theta? 
what are the various real numbers that cosine of theta could be? What's its range? It's the closed interval from what number to what number? What are the legitimate cosine values? They go from, so this value is going to be in, the closed interval from negative one to positive one. All right. It's kind of like a, a, if I have a dollar and you want to get money from me, it could be coins, you know, but let's say I have a dollar and you want to borrow money from me, okay? Well, if the most I'll give you is one dollar, right, which is the case here, if the most I can give you is one dollar, then in the end, it's a, it's a, then in the end, I'll have zero dollars remaining. I won't owe you anything, even though I'm lending you money anyway. I don't owe you anything. So here's the deal. You have one minus something that's never greater than one, right? Therefore, that means that one minus cosine of theta is non-negative for all thetas in the reals, for all real values of theta. So the bottom line, why is it that I can remove the absolute value on the top? Um, and it would be nice for you to make this comment here. That would be nice. The absolute value of one minus cosine of theta up on top becomes this, where you don't need the absolute value symbols, because this argument for absolute value is always non-negative. It's always non-negative. So therefore, the absolute value of this guy is just itself. And we're done. Okay, yeah, you, know, you don't have to write this, but you could write QED, end of proof. And we're totally done with that. All right. Uh, any more questions? I can follow the chat. Okay, uh, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question on F. I just can't seem to get it down at the end. So for one F, I started off by multiplying the top and bottom by the conjugate for the left side. Uh, are you able to share your screen? And by the way, as you do that, let me grab a quick drink of water, but could you share your screen with me? Is that possible or? or uh... Well, I wrote it down on paper and it's kind of sloppy. <laughs> oh, okay. But I can tell you what I did. All right. <clears throat> okay, so let me uh, grab another whiteboard here. Um, F. And uh, different students do it different ways. Uh, many students actually go right to left. Uh, but here's a case where, uh, yeah, if you go left to right, then you do really want to do that trig conjugate trick. So E and F kind of go together. Yeah. Yeah, I tried to do from right to left, but I couldn't figure it out. So I'm, I tried left to right, and I still can't get it. Look how weird that is. Um, Okay, so which way would you like to go, right to left or left to right? The, the left side I got further with. Okay, so you want to go there? All right. So, um, okay. <clears throat> okay. So we have this guy. All right. So the left-hand side, you should indicate what side you're starting with or copy. Equals, well, I will rewrite it anyway over here. One over one minus cosine of beta. We're going to use that trig conjugate trick because I don't know what else to do with this thing, right? One plus cosine of beta on the bottom and be fair. We're multiplying by one. Don't worry about domain issues for now. All right. And then when you do that, on the top, you just get that. You get one plus... cosine of beta over, similar to what we did before, you have uh, x minus y, x plus y. That product is x squared minus y squared. The square of one is one. We keep the minus sign. 
the square of cosine of beta is cosine of beta. Square, one minus cosine squared beta. Ah, <laughs> it's the square of one minus the square of cosine of beta. That's part of the point. We're gonna make this simpler. Questions thus far? Questions thus far? All right. Well, what is one minus cosine squared beta? Sine squared beta. Correct, says Mr. Pythagoras. So one plus cosine of beta over, hey, sine squared. of beta. All right, so we have one plus cosine squared beta over sine squared beta. Any questions so far? Yeah, why did you square the top? Numerator. No, oh, yeah, that's a typo. Yeah, um, let me. Okay, so one plus cosine of beta all over one all over sine square beta, sine square beta. All right. I think I was trying to copy that too there accidentally. All right. Okay. But now you look at uh, the right side, what's your target? Well, notice you have two terms on the right. So I think a good strategy would be to break up the fraction. Right. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I did. But then I got one over sine squared beta plus cosine over sine squared beta, and I don't, I did not know how to get the uh, answer out of that. Okay, plus cosine of beta over sine squared beta. Okay. So you see that one over sine squared beta is cosecant squared beta, right? Yeah. That term's fine. We're probably gonna have to factor or peel this thing apart. Cosecant of beta times cotangent of beta. All right, um, so I'll do this. Cosecant of beta, that's one over sine of beta, right? So one over sine of beta times, and then who's left? So tell me, who's left? When you factor out one over sine of beta, who's left on top, who's left on the bottom? Cosine on top and sine on the bottom. Good. And you're basically there. All right. Cosecant squared of beta. Remind me, what's the reciprocal of sine of beta? Co cosecant. Cosecant of beta. What's cosine of beta over sine of beta? It says cotangent. Yeah, Mr. Quotient, <laughs> the quotient rule, cotangent of beta. It's okay to leave the dot there. Hey, lo and behold, unless I'm losing my mind, I might be. <laughs> uh, cosecant square beta plus cosecant beta cotangent beta. Perfect. QED is optional. Okay, thank you, that, that makes sense now. Yes, you're welcome. I just didn't like take in a note that I could split one from that on the second part of it. I just forget like the basic stuff like that. Oh yeah, it's a trick. It's, it's basically a factoring, right? Where you're peeling apart pieces of the yeah. frame. Yeah, right? I, I just keep forgetting I can do stuff like that. Oh yeah, that's true because that's not a skill that's normally um, emphasized in, in your Algebra 1 or Algebra 2 class or the Common Core stuff, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's, yeah, but it's really good to know how to manipulate these various expressions as you enter calculus because often in calculus, what gets people is their intermediate algebra and their intermediate trig. Yeah, that's what I struggle with on these types of problems. Yeah. Oh, you and lots of people. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> yeah. But then you're all, you're all going to have fun with it, right? Meet the challenge. We'll talk about it a lot next week. And by the time you turn in the homework, I hope you'll feel very comfortable. That's the point. Um, so let, let's uh, uh, see what else is going on here um, in the chat.
I have a question on one more if no one else has one. Okay, uh, well, let me let me see what's... Oh, let me let me see. Let me check out some of these chat comments here. Okay, so I have, I have about three more, two in two in private, one public. All right. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll save this for now. Any questions about this before I put it away for now? Any questions? So, oh, wow. Okay, now I, I, I'm going to list these. <laughs> so, five, two, BG, and five, three, JKM. All right. Um, and just a comment. Uh, in case it comes up, in fact, in fact, uh, because the one that's being mentioned recently, I, I want to pull up the syllabus again. Uh, uh, this helps me too. So uh, to remind you, I, I typed this on my syllabus copy here. Okay, uh, remember I posted my Monday office hour with a student, and we covered uh, these two and these four, and I did B after the Thursday, the, the prior Thursday after class, and then in this Tuesday's class this week. I did 531M. All right, so that's where we are. So I've, so I've done about, about seven of them that are on video. Okay, now let's see where we are. Okay. Um, yeah, 52D is one of them. Okay, so 52D, you should check out my Monday Office Hour video. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave that for last, if possible. And then, yeah, we haven't done, I haven't done 53 yet with, with students individually. Okay, so, uh, well, let's, what's the flavor of 52D? Let me, uh, wait, 52D, I may have done that. Yeah, you, you did do 52D. I that's think. right, it's right here, right, 5-2-D. Yeah, that's right. Um, so 5-2-D I did, I, I, I already did. Uh, although I can discuss it again, but I do have a video for that. And then, um, right, 5-1-2-F I also did in the Monday Office Hour video. Right. Okay, so let's go straight, oh, wait, wait. So 5-2-D, uh, now G, I don't, Oh yeah, G. Yeah, people. Uh, people have been asking me about this, and I've given hints on this. I can go ahead and do this. All right. Although I'll probably have to do this next week as well. <laughs> All right. So five point two G. Well, I have a question for for five point two G. I I was just about to start it right now. Do you start it off on the left hand side by taking out tangent, like factoring out tangent of one half? That's right. That's the idea. Okay. And some okay. people might benefit from the substitution as well. In fact, that's how I was going to start it. All right. So let's let Okay. Let's let you be tangent of x. Okay. Then the left side here, equals equals u to the 5 halves plus u to the 1 half. All right. And then you're right. You factor out u to the 1 half and see what happens. Okay, so would anyone like me to proceed with this or would you like to kind of uh, play with it, chew with it before we discuss the homework session, discuss it, discuss problems, maybe including this in next week's homework session? 
I got it now. If well, I didn't ask for this question, but I got it. All right. Uh, would anyone like me to proceed with this, or I could proceed after you know at, at the end? Um, <clears throat> okay. Any questions? Okay. So I'm, I'm willing to proceed with this later on, but I want to get to the five three ones, the equation ones, because I've never done these. I haven't done these uh, individually, one on one with students, or 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 with groups. Okay. So let's do some of the five three ones. Okay, okay, J, J, K, M. All right, so let me ask the, um, the student, uh, which one shall we start with? And then uh, if necessary, if there are other students who are asking questions, I can, do, I can play ping pong. All right, uh, which one shall we start with? I guess it was uh, J, K, and M, right? J, so let's start with J, all right. All right, so let me uh, let me see here. Okay, let's do blue again. Ugh, that's horrible. There we go. <laughs> okay, cotangent theta equals zero. Oops. Five one three J. Right. One J. Okay. So when is cotangent theta equal to zero? See, cotangent of theta equals zero. Okay, now there are different ways of looking at this. Okay, one way to look at this is that cotangent of theta is zero if and only if tangent of theta is undefined. But still, we're making the assumption throughout that theta is still real. So when is tangent theta undefined? When I think tangent, I think slope. Where is slope undefined? North pole, south pole. Hence, oh, let me grab the uh, answers here. Nope. Uh, where are we? Yeah. 5.31J. Okay. Five, wait, 5.2. 5, 5. Gotta move the zoom bar. Okay, so let's take a look here. So when is tangent theta undefined? Yeah, for pi over two plus pi n. So here's the answer. <coughs> the set of all theta, oh, I, I should. Uh, So here's the answer. The set of all theta in the real such that theta equals what? Pi over two plus pi n, doing half revolutions. Okay, and if you just go around one time, you pick up pi over two and three pi over two. Okay, uh, any questions? Uh, this student seems to be satisfied uh, with this at this time. Remember, some students private chat me. And there's, there's, uh, there are two more, K and M.
Okay, so what shall we do next? KRM. Okay, K. Right. <clears throat> oh, I think I know what's happening. So on K, oh, okay, I gotta save this one. All right, K. Five point three one K. All right. So right off the bat, cotangent squared of theta equals three. Now, if we had x squared equals three, what could x be? Be careful. It could be plus or minus the square root of three. So by similar logic, right, um, we have cotangent theta uh, equals plus or minus root three. Although that time, um, uh, wait, what was I gonna say? Um, okay, cotangent co theta is plus or minus root three. So that's a key thing that people forget. They forget that it's a plus or minus. All right, so is that where, where you may have gotten hung up? Did you remember to put plus or minus? Did you remember to put plus or minus? Do you remember to put plus or minus? Ah, okay, so then you're losing about half the solutions then. So shall I, shall, um, I leave you with that and then can you try to adjust your solution and we'll come back to this next week? And by the way, it might help you to consider tangent instead. So uh, instead of cotangent of theta being this, take reciprocals tangent of theta equals plus or minus uh, one over root three or root three over three. So eventually you can get this to look like uh, tangent of theta equals plus or minus one over root three. Okay. But we like to rationalize denominators, technically. Tangent theta equals plus or minus root three over three. Okay, so uh, shall I leave you with that for now, and then we'll come back to this next week. Okay, uh, unless unless uh, there's an urgent need to, uh, you know, unless you'd really like to get uh, get taken care of today. Okay, uh, thank you. Yes. So yeah, thank you, Professor. I, thank you. I'm I think out. I got, uh, take care. Yes, yes. Um, I think I got all the ones in chat. Um, well, thank you for your persistence and hard work. It's 1010. Uh, any other questions? Uh, and now, uh, next week, I'll have some time for questions, maybe 30 minutes or so on Tuesday, and then all of Thursday next week. That's your day when you can just hit me with questions all day. Well, all session, not all, not all 24 hours. <laughs> I'm not that. Uh, uh, I'm not that intense, but uh, the, the class period and a bit beyond. Uh, any questions in the meantime? Any questions? I, I actually have a question. Uh, when do you think you'll get back to us the next graded assignment? So, like, we have like a good understanding of our what our grade will be like. Right, I know. right. In the it's, long bit run. By, it's bit by bit, and, and in fact, uh, I think in the next, I keep saying this, but in the, in, over the weekend, I think this is the first block of time I had in a while where I can sit down, 
grade homework. So uh, I am hoping to get the, uh, the, the, the chapter zero stuff, which was more involved than chapter one. Uh, I hope to get that back sometime mid next week. That's my hope. That's my hope. Uh, and then okay. the chapter two, three, uh, maybe by the beginning of Thanksgiving, because I'm going to be working through Thanksgiving break. So, um, uh, yeah, I got to play catch up. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering, because I want to know whether or not I'll have to do Alex for extra credit. Oh, I see. Um, I will say this, that I think, I think it's a good tool to play with in the meantime, but if it's a six week license, you don't want to waste your money or time either. So, um, yeah, I was just going to yeah. wait towards the end to do it. So I wouldn't waste it. Well, now we are, we are in week 12, right? And, and, uh, the last day of class is, is like a, is Thursday week 16. So if you were to purchase a six week license, then that will cover. Cause remember it's due. Yeah. I th is it, is it the following Monday? I think, I, I think it's due the following Monday, but, uh, um, yeah, yeah. So if you purchase a six week license now, it'll last you through, I think it's a Monday deadline. I I'm not sure. Let me, let me check. Yeah. I was just going to wait to see what my right. next homework score was to know, to decide whether or not I was going to do it. Oh, okay. But you know, in any case, uh, it, it's a good tool. And, and part of the purpose of the extra credit is to get you to play with Alex. And remember, I have other codes for other parts of the class. They're not for credit, but, but if you enjoy the Alex system, if uh, I've kind of uh, brought you in, right, then, uh, then you might find the other parts helpful, right? Um, but, but yeah, if it's, if also if it's a matter of uh, the cost issue, then I understand also that can also be an issue. Um, but in any case, your question, uh, when can I get chapter zero back? I'm going to work on it this weekend and I'm hoping midweek. Uh, oh, another thing that's, that's going on. Uh, I got called for jury duty, but I, I have to check online whether I'm actually, whether I actually have to go to the courthouse. And then there's a question as to whether I'm going to be impaneled. Uh, I'm hoping I don't get on a jury, but, uh, I don't want to even go there. <laughs> so let's hope I don't get on a jury and I'm looking at uh, mid next week or so. Yeah, good luck with that. Good night, Professor. Yeah, take Thank care. You. Yes, uh, yes, you're welcome. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, are there any other questions? Any other questions? Hi, Professor. <clears throat> Did you uh, skip 5.1G? Right. Did I miss you? Yeah, I may have missed some up here. Let me, let me see what else. I saw you doing and I just... Outside come back. Oh, okay. Oh, this is just like a new one. All right. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, which one? Uh, there was the one you were doing the G5. Wait, uh, what section? What um, section? Let me just see again. Ah, five one two. Two. Oh yes, yes. Continuing with that. Okay, sure. I can do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the only question I had about. Right. Oh yeah, this one here. So let's complete it. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, do you understand up to here? I did a substitution. Yes. We get, sure. Right. Right. You we have U the five has plus U the five. So you one half, right? Looks a lot nicer. That's a GCF. All right. Well, now when we factor, we do what D word, we divide. divide. Yes. And when we divide powers of U, let's say, what do we do with the exponents? Uh, we cancel it, right? Well, okay, so uh, what's, what's U to the fifth divided by U to the third? Oh, uh, we subtracted the The crack, right. Now I'm gonna indicate that. So we have, what's, okay, so, so we have U to the, what's U to the five halves divided by U to the one half, it's U to the five halves, minus one half oh, okay. plus and then one because you know this times one is himself right okay um and in fact i i i can do this as kind of side work over here on the side in, oh, in i can i just want to see that portion the first okay do you want to play with this you say what oh did you want to uh did you want me to stop and you could play with this or do you want to I, no no it's okay i, I continue on so i could see that Continue. Okay. Yeah. So just a basic uh, arithmetic, uh, arithmetic over here. Five halves minus one half, whoops, one half is four halves or two. 
you don't have to write that out, but, but mm -hmm. for, for video viewers, for example, who needed help on fractions, or if you did, then uh, we review this. All right. um, okay. All right, equals. Yes. U to the one half, and then U squared, right? That's two plus one. Okay, now we're done with basically the algebra phase. Now we're gonna go back to the trig phase. U is tangent of X. So it's uh, tangent of X. All to one half times the quantity tangent squared of x. Oops. Plus one. All right. So I'm summing back. Uh, now, uh, uh, if you raise something to the one half, you're taking the what of tangent of x. If you raise something to the one half exponent, you're taking the oh, root, right, times. Now, do you have a feeling for uh, uh, what identities might be helpful for tangent squared of x plus one? What identities might be helpful? Whose identities? The Pythagorean identities, right? Oh. Right. Uh, so I'll make a little note here. A secant square? Yep. I'll make a little note here, by Pythagorean. Um, you don't have to write by Pythagorean, but it helps you as a student, that's fine. This is mm -hmm. secant squared x, good. Because either you memorized it or you derived it from the big daddy. Now I think, uh, I, did I reorder it in this one? Um, yeah, technically, I, I, I reorder it. I reordered it, so technically you should uh, reorder the factors. Secant squared of x times root tangent of x. That's just moving things around. Right. Okay. Uh, and the QED is optional. That means end of proof. Oh, I, uh, I didn't realize it was be that simple. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, see, it's, it's one of those problems where the solution is not too long, but, but often it takes seeing it to really feel comfortable and understand it. Right, right. right. Okay. Yeah, many students say that to me that once they see it, they go, oh, yes, of course. But yeah, you, you start off with these fractional exponents and people just kind of freak out. Right. Yeah. yeah that's it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, did you have anything else at this time? No. no. Well, you covered all other questions I have through that. Okay. All right. All right. Um, uh, so I'll wait a minute and then I'll, I'll exit, but, uh, but uh, I'll wait a minute. Yeah. Okay.